Episode 121 Siri Finds Him Siri She heard Gary's voice thick with panic but ignored him. With shaking hands, she used a finger to draw on the mirror with the blood flowing from her wrist, a five-pointed star inside a circle. The mirror started to glow and a red symbol appeared. One large circle with two smaller circles inside it. Then two triangles appeared in one of the smaller circles, one inverted on top of the other. In the middle of the one triangle was another circle with symbols. Six other symbols were scribbled in the inverted triangle in what seemed to be a magic spell. Siri felt a rush of power flow through her. Her skin became as pale as the moon, her facial features became flawless, and her eyes turned scarlet red like the blood flowing from her wrist. Numquid ipse viveret, she asked in an unknown language. The meaning was, is he alive? The symbol disappeared and a message written in blood appeared, answering her question. Quad sit viver. He is alive. Her heart skipped a beat as she continued mumbling to herself. Asterid mihi. Show me. Her voice now reverberated with power. A gray, smoky, blurred image appeared in the mirror. Alan, she exclaimed her heart skipping a beat. She stumbled and nearly fell. If she didn't believe in her magic, she would have thought he was dead. Alan appeared to be unconscious. Her lips trembled and her heart ached to be by his side. Alan, she said again, her voice cracking as she tried to keep her tears at bay. She reached her right hand shakily toward the mirror as if reaching out to him. Her eyebrows furrowed and her eyes reflected despair when she saw the blood seeping from Alan's head. His clothes were charred and his skin badly burned. His back seemed to have received the impact of the explosion. He was lying on the grass on the outskirts of a town. From the look of things, someone had dumped him there. No wonder they can't find him, she thought, covering her mouth with her hands. She felt like the world was closing in on her. He's been lying there for days, she thought. It's a miracle that he's still alive. Ube Estis. Where is he? Siri asked, her voice shaking. There was a sound of someone forcing the bedroom door open. Siri knew she had to hurry. She was losing too much blood. Even though power was flowing through her, she grew weaker by the second. This was a deadly spell. If her father had been there, he wouldn't have allowed her to do it. An address appeared in the mirror, which she memorized quickly before the bathroom door burst open. Siri's eyes became their usual brown color, and her facial features returned to normal. The words in the mirror disappeared. Everything looked ordinary. Siri! Gary's panicked voice called her. He saw her standing in front of the mirror with her back to him. He was afraid she'd evaporate into thin air and disappear. Siri! He called again but she didn't respond. Gary looked at the floor and saw the pool of blood. His heart hammering in his chest, he rushed to her side. Siri turned to him and muttered an address. Find him, please, she said before falling to the floor and losing consciousness. Gary pulled her upper body onto his lap and clamped his hand over her wrist, applying pressure to stop the blood flow. He wouldn't forgive himself if anything happened to her. He knew how much she meant to Alan whose eyes would sparkle when he spoke about her. She was the sun in his dark world after his brother's death. Now that he wasn't with her, his friends would have to protect her. Gary lifted her to his chest, her legs over his forearms, and hurried to his car parked in front of the house. He was in a panic, his brain foggy. He had forgotten he was a doctor and could have performed first aid before rushing her out to the car. First Alan, now Siri, he thought hitting the accelerator. His Porsche fishtailed onto the main road and he drove recklessly to the hospital's emergency room entrance. Surprise flashed through people's eyes when they saw him jump from the car, his shirt crusted with blood. Two nurses burst through the emergency room's automatic double glass doors and rushed toward him with a gurney. He watched as they lifted Siri onto it and strapped oxygen over her nose and mouth. Guilt gnawed at him as he followed them. Suddenly, his phone rang, snapping him from his thoughts. He saw that it was Edward. What happened? Is she okay? Edward asked hurriedly. 
She slid her wrist. Gary answered. What? Where are you now? Edward asked. The hospital emergency room. Edward frowned when he heard Gary's tone. Are you okay? Edward asked, concerned about lacing his voice. I didn't get to her early enough. I'll never forgive myself, Gary responded. Edward heaved a sigh. Why is everything falling apart? He thought and then said, I'm on my way. Text me the address. Gary suddenly remembered the address Siri had given him in her plea. No, she gave me an address. She would begged me to find him. He said forcefully. Edward's face creased into a frown when he heard this. What are you talking about? I think she was talking about Alan. She gave me an address before passing out. Gary repeated, his voice excited. I'll send you the address. I think you should go to New York. Don't worry. Henry and I will take care of everything here, Gary said. Edward turned to look at Henry and nodded. Okay, send me the address, he said. Richard groaned. His head was spinning, and his skin had the sensation of ants crawling on it. His eyelids felt heavy, and his throat was sore and dry. His mind was slowly trying to regain consciousness as he struggled to open his eyelids. When they fluttered open, sunlight was beaming through the window to his right. The room was quiet, but he could hear voices nearby, making him frown. Slowly, he lifted a hand to his head and realized it was bandaged. He remembered that he and Alan were attacked on their way to the airport. Panic clawed through him as he fought to sit upright, but the pain in his lower abdomen stopped him. Richard groaned. He hated feeling weak. Where is Alan? Is he okay? He thought, taking in his surroundings. He realized he was in an apartment bedroom. A woman opened the door. Her hair was tied into a messy bun, and her glasses were too big for her face. A trace of surprise crossed her face. You're awake, she exclaimed. Richard's face contorted with pain, and he frowned as he looked at her. Who are you? He asked huskily. The woman poured a glass of water and handed it to him. I'm Angie. I saw you lying in the middle of the road when I was returning from work. Your car was in an accident. Richard nodded. Why didn't you take me to the hospital? He asked. Angie shrugged. I saw a group of men pick up another man lying on the road and carry him to their car. They looked dangerous, so I waited until they left before I approached you. I thought if I took you to the hospital, they might kill you, like in the movies. So I brought you here instead. Richard stiffened when he heard what she said. You said they took the other man away? He asked forcefully. Angie stepped back in fright. Seeing the scared look on her face, Richard apologized awkwardly. Sorry. It's okay. Yes, they put him in a car and drove away. Richard's frown deepened. He knew that whoever had taken Alan was responsible for their accident. But who was it? Episode 122 He Was Poisoned Who was that man? Why did they take him away? Angie asked, snapping Richard from his haze. Can I have a cell phone? Richard asked, ignoring her questions. Whoever had taken Alan, he needed to find him as soon as possible. He needed to make a call. Angie nodded and removed her phone from her pocket, handing it to Richard. Once she had left, Richard dialed. After a single ring, the call was connected. It's me, he said weakly. Thank heavens, a relieved voice exclaimed. Richard furrowed his eyebrows as a wave of pain hit him. Trace this number and find my location. The pain forced him to take a deep breath before continuing. <sighs> we had an accident. I've woken up in an apartment. The woman who brought me here says she saw some men take Alan away. I need backup to find him. Call Edward Collins. He'll know what to do, Richard said. If anyone could help them find Alan fast, it was Edward. I'll do that right away, the man replied respectfully, not asking any questions. And make sure none of this is made public, Richard commanded. Yes, don't worry, we'll find you soon. Richard hung up and heaved a sigh. 
Thinking back, a realization struck him. Before the accident, he remembered that Alan had been poisoned, and the only suspicious person who came to mind was Mike Andre. But how had he poisoned Alan? It wasn't a simple plot. Whoever had planned this was a dangerous person. They needed to find out who it was. The sooner, the better. The door opened and Angie came in holding a tray containing a bowl of oatmeal and a mug of coffee. She placed the tray on the table by the bed. Eat. You need your energy. You've been sleeping for three days. Richard stiffened. What? Three days? He exclaimed in panic. Angie nodded. She was getting used to his harsh tone and didn't react this time. Richard's heart hammered hard in his chest. Alan's been missing for three days. Where have they taken him? Is he alive? He wondered. He knew he needed to find Alan quickly. If something happens to him, I'll never forgive myself. He thought miserably. Richard tried to get up, but the moment his feet hit the floor and he stood, he staggered. If Angie hadn't caught him, he would have fallen to the floor. Where do you think you're going? She scolded him, helping him sit back on the bed. I need to find the man that was with me, Richard said anxiously. Angie frowned. I don't think he was alive from how they were carrying him, she said gently. When she saw the look in Richard's eyes, she stepped back in fright. There was a deadly silence in the room. Angie's words echoed in Richard's ears. But he couldn't have died. He reasoned to himself. He didn't want to believe it. Alan wouldn't die so easily. Even though you want to find him, you need to eat first and take your medication. After that, we can search for him. Richard frowned and stared at the woman in front of him. What? Angie asked, a confused frown on her face. Richard's intense gaze was making her uncomfortable. Why did you save me? He asked. He had been trained to do the saving, and now that someone had saved him, he felt perplexed. Angie shrugged. I think anyone in my shoes would have done the same thing. Now eat before the oatmeal gets cold. I'll dress your wound afterward. Richard raised his eyebrows. You've been taking care of me? He asked. Angie nodded. Yes, I'm the doctor in this town, she replied. Richard didn't say anything. He stared at the oatmeal and his stomach growled. Are you afraid that I'm going to poison you? Angie asked, rolling her eyes. If I wanted you dead, I would have killed you before now. Richard looked up at her and then at the food on the table. She's right. If she wanted me dead, she would have done it already without waiting for me to wake up. He thought... He needed his strength to search for Alan. He started eating the oatmeal hungrily. Edward made calls to his men and to his pilot once Gary had sent the address Siri had given him. Once he was on the plane to New York, he looked at the address and his brow furrowed in deep thought. Where did Siri get it? And why was she so sure that Alan was there? Sir, we're about to land, his assistant said, snapping him out of his daze. There was a car waiting for them at the airport. He gave the address to the driver before impatiently snapping, Let's go! When they reached the location, his phone started to ring. Edward ignored the call, but the person calling was persistent and kept ringing back. He eventually took his phone from his pocket and answered the unfamiliar number. XX11087, the person said, reciting a series of codes the moment Edward picked up the call. He recognized the codes as identities given to persons in the military. Edward's eyes narrowed. What's the emergency? He asked coldly. He was in a hurry to find Alan and didn't want to deal with any other problems. Reporting a call from Nightmare. There has been an accident. We need your help to find our captain. The caller said without beating about the bush. From what he was hearing, Edward realized that Richard was not with Alan. Copy that. Fine nightmare. I'll take care of the rest. All right, sir. Edward hung up and turned to look at the men with him in the car. Find him. Make sure you leave no stone unturned. 
he commanded. Yes, sir. They chorused in unison and left the car to begin their search. Half an hour later, they hadn't found anyone. Have you found anything? Edward asked through the radio. West coast is clear, sir. The east coast is clear. The north coast is clear. Edward pinched the bridge of his nose. His anxiety was increasing by the second. I found him, an excited voice said. The south coast. Edward rushed to the location he had been given. He stopped in his tracks when he saw Alan lying on the ground, motionless. He couldn't bring himself to move another step closer. He looked at Alan's pale face covered with blood. Is he alive? He asked hesitantly. He was in a panic. Yes, he has a pulse, but it's extremely weak. We need to hurry or we might lose him. The man bending over Alan said. Edward nodded and turned to look at his assistant. We have to transport him to the mansion. Edward's men lifted Alan carefully and carried him to the car. A hospital had already been set up at the mansion. Before coming to New York to find Alan, he had organized a team of the best doctors to treat him when he was found. He hadn't wanted to risk Alan's life by taking him to an emergency room at a hospital. It took an hour to arrive at the mansion. Alan had weakened further and the doctors were surprised that he was still alive. They started treating him at once. Edward sat on a chair and tapped his feet while they worked on Alan. He was waiting for them to report any news. While waiting, he couldn't help but think about what was going on. He wondered what had caused Alan and Richard's car accident. From his investigations, he knew they had visited Mike Andre to sign the contract and that an unknown man was leaving when they had arrived. So he was highly suspicious of them. He had also seen that Alan's lips were blue, so he suspected that he had been poisoned. Only a few people knew Alan's real identity when he was in the military, so it was unlikely to be an enemy from his military work. Edward's phone rang, snapping him from his thoughts. He saw from the caller ID that it was Gary. Did you find him? Gary asked the moment Edward picked up the phone. Yes, Edward said, but gave no further information. Gary frowned. Siri was stable and hadn't lost a lot of blood. The emergency room doctor was concerned about her mental state and had emphasized that he should take good care of her. The doctor's harsh scolding was fresh in his mind. He heaved a sigh and asked, What's wrong? Is he okay? Edward raked his fingers through his hair and replied, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? The doctors are treating him right now. I'm still waiting for their report. Gary removed his glasses and rubbed his eyes tiredly. Okay, update me when you've heard. Okay, how's Siri? Edward asked, to which Gary answered. She's stable now and sleeping. She should wake up soon. Edward leaned against the chair. Don't tell anyone about Alan yet. I don't want to give them hope until I know for sure. He trailed off, sighing deeply. I understand. Call me when you know. I will, Edward said and hung up. Episode 123, Don't Let Him Die. The moment Gary hung up, he made his way to Siri's room to check on her. His heart jumped when he saw her bed was empty. Siri? He called out, but no one replied. Flustered, he pressed the bell several times to call the nurses. Two nurses hurried into the room. One asked, Sir, is there a problem? When they saw his panic-stricken face. Where is she? Gary demanded. The two nurses looked at each other, realizing the bed was empty and the patient's IV drip had been removed. A few drops of blood stained the bedsheets. I'll check the bathroom, one of them said and hurried out. The nurse returned after a few seconds, shook her head and said, She's not in there. Gary felt he was losing his sanity. He wanted this to be over. Where is she? He thought trying to stay calm and think clearly. Do you have a surveillance camera in the hallway? He asked. The nurses realized that the patient and this man must be important because this was a ward reserved for VIPs. Yes, sir. I'll call security, came the answer. Okay, tell them it's urgent. 
Gary said, following the nurses. A few minutes later, an agitated middle-aged man hurried towards Gary. The nurses had informed security that a patient in the VIP ward was missing, and they had informed the hospital's president. This was the first time a patient had gone missing, and he was worried about the hospital's reputation. A trace of surprise crossed his face when he saw Gary Frank. He was a well-known and respected surgeon. He had listened to his speech at a conference, and had been impressed that a surgeon so young could have achieved so much. Dr. Frank. The hospital president greeted Gary. The nurses opened their mouths when they heard the man's name and the president's obvious respect for him. They had heard about the famous Dr. Frank, but because he was low-key, only a few people knew or had seen him. They were excited by the prospect of meeting him that day. The doctor who had scolded him earlier was hurrying towards them and stopped in his tracks when he heard the president address Gary. He had heard his patient was missing and he had come to investigate. He was worried about the patient's mental state because she had slit her wrist. He had assumed Gary was the reason that she had done that to herself, so he had scolded him earlier. But he knew of Dr. Frank and idolized his work. He could not believe that he had scolded him earlier, so he stood there awkwardly, not knowing what to do or say. Gary nodded at the hospital president. Can I see the surveillance camera from room 303's hallway? He asked. The president nodded and swallowed hard. Of course, please follow me. He was finding it hard to believe that the person Gary had personally brought to his hospital was missing. He called the head of security as they walked so that they were waiting for them. Dr. Frank, please tell them what you need, the president said when they arrived at the security room. The surveillance from room 303's hallway for the past few hours, Gary instructed. The head of the security team nodded and showed Gary the video images of Siri coming out of the room, looking left and right, pausing when she saw him on the phone, and then walking away from him. Gary heaved a sigh. Is there surveillance of where she was going? He asked. Gary frowned when he saw the images of Siri leaving the hospital and getting into a black car at the entrance. The car seemed to have been waiting for her. Is that all? The head of security asked. Yes, thank you, Gary answered. The president's eyebrows rose in surprise when he saw that the missing person was a woman. Is the famous surgeon married, or is it a girlfriend? He wondered. Miss, we're here. Are you sure you want to do this? If he finds out, the driver of the car said. Rusty, who do you work for? Siri asked, cutting him off and giving him an icy glare. Rusty bowed his head in acknowledgement. Siri had saved him two years ago. He had no memory of his name or who he was. He had pledged to repay her, and he had trained hard to be her personal bodyguard. He was like her shadow, following her quietly, unseen and unheard. Unfortunately, he had been injured a few months ago and needed to disappear for a while. When he had returned, Siri was married. He was happy for her. He had seen her sadness in the years he had been with her. When he had received her call to pick her up from the hospital, he had responded immediately. He had been afraid that something serious had happened to her, but soon realized it was her husband who was in danger. Alan had traveled to New York on business. Ignoring him, Siri focused on opening the portal. She gave a flick of her wrists as she waved her hands. Her eyes instantly turned scarlet red as a swirling water-like barrier as tall as her appeared beside her. It reflected a busy street in New York. The crowds walking down the street were incapable of seeing the portal. Siri raised her chin and walked resolutely through it, followed by Rusty. They found themselves alone in a hidden alley in Times Square. Exiting the alley, they saw a car organized by Rusty waiting for them. The driver nodded at them when they got in. Rusty barked an address at the driver and the car's occupants fell silent. To Siri, every second was torturous. She had no idea if Alan was dead, alive, or badly injured. She leaned against the car seat and closed her eyes, trying to stay calm. Half an hour later, the car stopped in front of a mansion. Siri opened her eyes and arched her eyebrows. Are you sure he's here? She asked. Yes, miss, Rusty replied. 
Siri's face creased into a frown when she saw the mansion's tight security. She was afraid that Edward hadn't reached Alan in time and the enemy had found him. You know what to do, Siri said flatly to Rusty. He got out of the car and disappeared without a word. Siri tapped her feet anxiously waiting for him. Ten minutes later, he returned to the car. Miss, there are men inside. The one in charge looks dangerous. We need to be careful. Also, I saw doctors in another room. They appeared to be treating an unconscious man, he reported. Siri opened the car door quickly and rushed toward the mansion. From Rusty's description, she knew Edward was the man in charge. A guard saw a woman wearing a hospital gown running towards the mansion's entrance and frowned. He stepped into her path, blocking her. Where are you going? He demanded. Siri ignored him and tried to get by him, but he stood his ground. She couldn't get around him. Call Mr. Collins. Tell him Siri Kenster is here, she said. The guard looked at her warily, but turned to go to Edward. Looking at her thin body in the hospital gown, he couldn't help but feel sorry for her. What do you mean she's left the hospital? Edward bellowed into the phone. A car was waiting to pick her up when she left the hospital, so I guess she's okay. Gary muttered defensively. Edward sighed. Suddenly, he heard footsteps and saw a guard running toward him. Sir, there is a Miss Kenster here asking for you. The guard announced, not noticing Edward was on the phone. Edward stood up and said, What? Miss Kenster is here? The guard stepped back in fright. Yes, sir. Should I send her away? He replied. What time did she leave the hospital? Edward asked Gary on the other side of the phone. Forty minutes ago, Gary replied, looking at his watch. Then how did she get to New York in such a short time? Edward asked, frowning. She's there? Gary asked, bewildered. Let me go and see, Edward replied, rushing after the guard. He saw Siri standing at the front door in a hospital gown. Where is he? She asked the moment she saw him. Is it her? Gary asked in confusion. Yes, Edward said to Gary and hung up. He was stunned at seeing Siri in New York at the mansion. Where is he? Siri asked again, snapping him from his thoughts. Siri, how did you get here? He asked in surprise. How I got here isn't important. Is he here? She said. She was irritable and becoming annoyed. Edward took her arm and let her inside. The doctors are still operating on him. Sit down, he said. Siri ignored him and continued standing, staring at the door of the room where the doctors were attending to Alan. Her heart was shattering with every second that passed. I want to go in, she said, swallowing hard. Edward frowned. He wanted to refuse, but one look from Siri and he decided against it. I'll arrange it, he responded. Five minutes later, Siri was ushered into the room. She stopped in her tracks when she saw Alan's unresponsive body lying on the bed, surrounded by doctors and nurses. His skin was horrendously pale. Suddenly, a doctor shouted, causing Siri's heart to jump. We're losing him! Siri staggered back and cried. Save him, please! She walked over to Alan's nearly lifeless body and reached her shaking hand to touch his cheek. Alan, you have to wake up, please, she whimpered. The poison is spreading to his heart, hurry, someone in the room said as the monitors started beeping loudly. Alan, please, please don't leave me, I love you, I love you, she said, her voice rising in panic. Siri was hoping he would say something, but only the bitter words of the doctor rang in her ears. He's not breathing. Siri felt her entire world shattering around her. She wanted to believe she was hallucinating. No, save him. You have to, or I'll bury all of you with him, she said vehemently. She stared at Alan's lifeless body and gave a pained cry. The light in her eyes dulled. I've lost him. I've lost him, 
she thought in despair. Tears fell from her eyes as she pressed a kiss onto his icy lips. The doctors just stared at her, and no one dared say anything. Siri knew the last bit of her sanity was gone. It had died with Alan. Episode 124 There Will Be No Mercy Siri moved away from the bed and crossed her arms in front of her chest with her chin held high. She shot the doctors with a look of pure rage. The doctors stepped back in fear, their eyes widening as a red mist descended over Siri's eyes, and the veins stood out on her forehead. A powerful gust of wind blew into the room, making the lights flicker on and off. The doctors looked around in bewilderment as the main light in the center of the ceiling exploded, the glass shards falling to the floor. They rushed to the door to escape, but the moment their hands touched the handle, it locked shut. When the doctors realized they had no option but to stay in the room, they turned to look at Siri with expressions of pure fear. She uttered a mocking laugh, and her sinister voice echoed around the room. You have to save him! She shouted. She looked from one doctor to another with an expression of such intensity that the physicians felt more powerless than they ever had before in the course of their careers. I will bury you with him if he dies! One of the doctors walked to Siri's side and tried to put his arm around her in a gesture of comfort, but Siri would have none of it. Before he could do so much as touch her, she slapped him as hard as she could on the cheek. The blow was so forceful that the man was flung clear across the room. He hit the ground hard, with a cut opening on the side of his head. Blood gushed onto the floor. So, shall we start? Siri asked twirling her hair playfully with one hand and jabbing an accusatory finger at the petrified doctors with the other. The doctors were too frightened to respond. Siri shrugged. How pathetic you all are! Edward, who was waiting outside the room, heard a scream rend the air from the other side of the door and ran toward it. He knocked on it anxiously. Siri? There was no answer, only more screaming and moans of pain. Edward rattled the door handle, but the door wouldn't open. Why is it locked? He wondered frantically. Adrenaline was coursing through his veins. He put his shoulder to the door to try to force it open, but even then it wouldn't budge. What on earth is going on in there? He thought. Inside the room, Siri nonchalantly tilted her head to one side. She seemed detached, like a child forcing herself to play a game that did not really absorb her. A doctor tried to restrain her, but with lightning speed, she punched him squarely on the nose, leaving him reeling. She traced a pattern in the air with her index finger, slowly drawing a slash. The doctor's jaws dropped further when they saw a cut develop in the same slashing pattern on their colleague's forehead. The doctor pawed helplessly at the blood trickling down his face, but it continued to pour out, dripping over his mouth and chin. When he tasted his own blood, he fainted. Seeing him slump to the ground, the others held up their hands as if to surrender to this formidable woman. They all backed away. One of the doctors spoke up through his terror. Please spare us, we beg you. Siri looked at them long and menacingly before she replied. Why should I spare you? Did fate spare me from cruelty? Shaking with anger, she threw her arms up dramatically into the air and said in a penetrating voice that kept the doctors transfixed. Let me tell you a story. The room fell silent. They all stared at Siri, anxious to hear what she was about to say and what it could mean for them. Indifferent to their reaction, she started narrating her tale. Once upon a time, there was a princess who lived in a castle. She was the only child of the king and queen who doted on her. Because of the love and protection she received from her parents, the princess grew up to be quite naive. She believed in the good of humanity. However, there's no good in humanity, and she learned this the hard way. When the princess had reached a marriageable age, a prince from another country came to ask for her hand in marriage. Her father refused, but the princess had fallen head over heels in love with the prince, so she went ahead and married him anyway. 
Siri began to pace up and down as she related the tale, her voice dominating the room. The moment she stepped foot in her husband's house, however, she went from being a princess to a lowly servant. Siri sighed deeply, as if to convey the humiliation of this loss of status. But because she loved her husband so much, she put up with the constant abuse from her mother-in-law and never once complained. One year into the marriage, a merciless villain killed her parents. A year after that, on the exact date of their second wedding anniversary, her husband threw her out onto the street, accusing her of cheating on him. He gave no explanation. Siri tilted her chin up in defiance, with the glint of malice in her eyes. That night, she lost everything, even her innocent child. Five years later, she found happiness for a second time, but fate snatched her love away from her. That destroyed the last shred of sanity she had left, turning our beloved princess into a cold-blooded demon. As she finished her story, Siri clapped her hands, laughing as merrily as if she had been told a side-splitting joke. She laughed until tears poured down her cheeks. The doctors couldn't keep their eyes off her, and their faces betrayed their confusion. They didn't know whether her tears were because she genuinely found the story funny, or because it made her sad. Did fate spare her a painful life? She asked, and continued talking, without waiting for a response, her voice filled with anger. No. So why the hell should I spare you? She threw her hands up in the air in a flourish, and in three strides, bounded up to one of the doctors. Placing one hand under his armpit and the other around his neck, she wrenched him off his feet in a move that would have made the finest martial artist proud. The doctor had not been chosen at random. It was the one who had reported that Alan had stopped breathing. Siri remembered how he had announced the news and how she had felt. As anger rose inside her, she hurled him like a bag of garbage. His body hit the wall a clear four feet away. The sickening sound of breaking bones made the other doctors blanch with fear. This brutal move seemed to spur them into action to save themselves before it was too late. One who had positioned himself behind Siri grabbed an IV stand beside him and swung it toward her head. But she was far too quick on her toes. With cat-like speed, she spun out of the way and flashed the doctor a mocking smirk. Flinging out a hand, she grasped the IV stand to arrest its motion, preventing the doctor from swinging it any further through the air. How on earth can she be so strong? The doctor wondered in astonishment. In the blink of an eye, Siri wrenched the stand from his hands and turned the improvised weapon against him, smashing him roundly on the head and knocking him to the ground. Siri then looked over at the bed in which her beloved Alan was lying. Her eyes softened as she slowly walked over, the remaining doctors melting away before the terrifying woman. She sat down on the side of the bed and placed her hand on Alan's face, her thumb caressing his cheek as she whispered to him through trembling lips. Oh, Alan, she murmured, cradling her husband in her arms. As she rocked him back and forth in a passionate embrace, she was no longer able to keep her tears at bay and wept openly. It eventually dawned on her that the doctors who had been unable to save him were still present, and she turned back toward them, gazing at them with malice. It's their fault, she said quietly as if to herself. Carefully straightening the blankets covering her husband's body, she stood up and spoke to them ominously. I will show you no mercy. Episode 125, A Father's Intervention Mason sighed as he contemplated the tower of papers stacked on his desk. He skimmed through a couple and sighed again as he wondered how long it would take to go through the whole pile. Picking up a pen, he began to sign and initial all the documents on the dotted lines. It was just as well that he had been doing his job for years, otherwise he would have to do more than just skim the papers to know what needed to be done. When only part of the document stack had been completed, Mason stopped his work and sat up straight. He could feel a strong emotion deep inside him, a presentiment that something ominous was happening. He stood up slowly and looked around. 
Mason had the reputation of a powerful man with great intuition, so as soon as Michael, his assistant, saw his boss's mood change, he knew something was up and approached him hesitantly to find out what was going on. Is something the matter, sir? Mason shook his head in response. He looked at Michael gravely and a few moments later spoke to him in a low voice that effortlessly dominated the room. Check up on Siri. Yes, sir. As soon as he received his boss's order, Michael called Rusty. Rusty, the boss wants to know what Siri is doing right now, at this exact moment. Well, Rusty said, his voice trailed off before he continued. She's in New York and she's inside a room. Mason could clearly hear the conversation and shot an intense look at Michael. He rose from his chair and walked deliberately toward his assistant. He began to speak to Rusty while Michael continued to hold the phone. What exactly is she doing right now, Rusty? Mason's voice was so thick with purpose that Rusty gulped nervously, but he wouldn't have dreamed of failing to answer his boss's question. I'll find that out for you immediately, sir. With that, Michael ended the conversation. Barely a moment later, Rusty was breaking into the back of Edward's mansion, his identity concealed by the mask and gloves he was wearing. Edward was still struggling with the door and saw Rusty as soon as he entered the spacious entrance hall. Who the hell are you and how did you get inside my house? Edward inquired. Rusty ignored Edward and rushed over to put his ear to the door. He could hear groans and wails coming from inside. Siri was shouting. You incompetent fools! You're doctors for a reason, which is to heal. Did you become doctors in order to fail? Having obtained all the information he wanted, Rusty slipped out of the mansion as quickly and quietly as he had arrived and contacted Mason to inform him of the intelligence he had gathered. Sir, it seems that Siri is being very violent with some doctors she holds responsible for having let Alan die. What? Mason cried, gritting his teeth in amazement. He gripped his hands into fists and decided to go himself to the mansion there and then. Where is she? Give me the address. Rusty informed Mason of the address, and the boss disappeared from his office in the blink of an eye, baffling his assistant, who was also in the room. What the? gasped Michael, open-mouthed. Even though he was aware of his boss's special abilities, he was nevertheless surprised every time he saw him use them. He had never seen anything like this before he had started working for Mason. A moment later, Mason was in the same room as Siri. Siri didn't notice her father until she saw the doctor's gasp, and looking over her shoulder, she discerned the figure of a powerfully built man. What are you doing here? Siri. Mason only said her name, but it rooted her to the spot. Mason looked around him to take in the situation. He saw blood on the floor and a number of doctors lying in pain around the room, the remainder cowering in fear. His first thought was to wonder what had triggered Siri to act in such a manner, but he knew the reason as soon as he saw Alan's lifeless body lying on the bed. He sighed and shook his head. Siri laughed and tossed her head. Have you come to join in the fun, father? Her lips curled into a scornful smile. Mason gripped his brow as he realized the truth. His daughter had lost her mind. Now listen, Siri. Mason said to her in a firm yet understanding voice. You have to stop. This isn't the right way to solve this. Irritation surged through Siri as she heard her father's words. It's their fault. They have to feel my despair. I will put them six feet under. That's enough. Mason's voice echoed around the room as if he were speaking through a megaphone. Do you really think that the man who loved you would want you to do this for him? It had been a long time since she had heard her father's voice, and it was enough to bring Siri to her senses. She trembled as she braced her legs to keep herself from falling to her knees. Her icy demeanor was suddenly shattered, and she felt scared and vulnerable again, in complete contrast to the murderous rage that had filled her a moment before. Seeing that his daughter had calmed down a bit, Mason went up to her, enveloped her in a strong hug, and dragged her out of the room with him. It looked for all the world as if Mason was just a parent who was dealing firmly with an unruly child, even though they were both adults with astonishing abilities. The doctors stared at the two as they walked out arm in arm. 
Mason was the sort of man who immediately commanded a room's attention, and then there was the fact that he had appeared suddenly, as if from nowhere. The doctors were intimidated and confused. When Mason and Siri stepped out of the room, Edward was still in the hallway. He looked at them in bafflement. How did you get in here, and who are you? Mason ignored the question and let go of his daughter, but addressed her sternly. If you had stayed in that room a moment longer, I think your sanity would have been lost beyond repair. Despite his confusion at what was taking place, the statement piqued Edward's curiosity. The door to the room was still ajar, so he glanced inside to see what had caused all the commotion. Edward stared in amazement and fear at the scene that greeted his eyes. The room was in chaos, and the floor was splattered with blood. But it wasn't until Edward noticed his best friend's body lying on the bed that his lips started to tremble. Alan? He covered his face with his hands to conceal the awful sight, but turned around when he felt a tap on his shoulder. It was Mason. Best to step aside. What's going to happen can make you faint. Edward immediately knew that the man speaking to him was someone who possessed great powers and meekly nodded as he returned to the hallway in a daze. What the hell is happening in my mansion? He mumbled. Before he knew it, the door behind him closed and he saw that the man had gone into the room to be alone with the doctors and Alan's body. The doctors cowered in fear once more as Mason scanned them. They could tell that this man was even more powerful than the woman who had inflicted such violence on them just a short while before. Please, let us go, they whimpered. I will, Mason answered, causing a glint of hope to appear on the doctor's faces. Their eyes widened as they saw Mason hold up a hand from which a ray of light was emanating. First of all, I'm just going to heal everyone and give you a, what do you call it? He knelt in front of one of the doctors and gave him a charming smile. Selective amnesia. The doctors looked like they were trying to understand what this remark could mean. And after that, will you let us go? The words came from the head physician who had suffered the most from Ceres' wild brutality. Of course, Mason answered with a smile. He went to each suffering doctor in turn to heal them and erase their memory of what had happened. They then passed out on the cold floor. After that, he turned his attention to Alan. He walked over to him and placed a hand on his chest as a gleam of interest lit his eyes. Interesting. Very interesting. Episode 126 It's Dangerous As soon as Mason emerged from the room, Siri rushed into his arms. Mason heaved a sigh of joy and patted her back gently. Siri clutched his shirt. Father. Siri broke down and sobbed. Hot tears streamed down her face and soaked her father's shirt, piercing deep into Mason's heart. She struggled to breathe and held on to her father for dear life. It was as if she was drowning in a pool of acid. Mason said nothing. He just held her close. This was his precious daughter. She had been a young woman full of life, joy, and happiness, and Mason looked back to the time when a single smile from Siri could brighten his mood. But one day, everything changed. Her smiles had ceased and the light in her eyes had disappeared. From then on, whenever she had smiled, it had seemed like a tedious task she was forcing herself to do. Her eyes had become blank, whereas she had once radiated confidence, she had become lifeless. Until she met Alan. Even though Mason had been against the rushed marriage, he had seen how happy this man had made her. And as a father, that was all he wanted, to see his daughter happy. So Mason had said nothing, and he had allowed them to be together. But as usual, fate had been cruel to his daughter. Siri pulled away from her father and looked up at him. In turn, Mason looked down at his daughter's dull and empty eyes. They made him feel like he was dying as well. He stared at her as tears slowly rolled down from her face. Her shoulders slumped. Please, father. Siri managed to choke out. Please save him. Her voice cracked and caught in her throat, so she closed her eyes and waited for her father's response. The only person who could save Alan was her father. My dear Siri, 
Mason's voice was so gentle that Siri opened her eyes and again looked full into her father's face. Her chest was as tight as if someone was sitting on it, so tight that she could hardly breathe. As a diabolical thought occurred to her, Siri stepped back, a crazed smile on her lips. You... you don't want to, father? Her mouth quivered. Siri, you know it's dangerous. There are many dangers inherent in waking up a dead person. No! Siri screamed, and she thumped her father's chest. I will not accept it! Bring him back! With that, she fell to the floor in a disheveled heap, her grief pouring out in a flood of uncontrollable tears. Gut-wrenching sobs racked her chest. My husband is the light in my darkness. Please, please bring him back to me. Edward stared at Siri writhing on the floor. It made him feel sour and jaded. He had never believed in love, but seeing Siri's desperation to see her husband alive again, he began to wonder. If I were to die one day, would someone cry like this for me? He looked away and his chin trembled with a single solemn tear trickling down to his chin. Although he managed to maintain an outward calm, Edward's heart and mind were tangled and confused. He couldn't even remember the last time he had cried. He hadn't cried when he had lost his cat as a child, or even when he had been kidnapped and tortured at the age of 15. Most people he had met had concluded that he was as unemotional as a block of wood. It was very upsetting to see Siri mumbling incoherently to herself as she choked on her sobs, which echoed throughout the otherwise quiet hallway. Even Edward's bodyguard, who had been trained not to show emotions, betrayed his true feelings as he stared with red eyes at the woman sitting on the floor in a hospital gown, crying for her dead husband. Her face was puffy and tear-stained, and she seemed fragile, as if she had lost weight. Happy memories of moments she had spent with Alan flashed through Siri's mind as she recalled loving words that he had spoken to her. Wifey, let me make you happy, okay? Sweetie, you're insanely gorgeous. I can't believe that you're all mine. Wifey, let me worship you. A woman like you deserves to be worshipped. Yes, it's true. I'm crazy in love with you. You mean everything to me, sweetie, and we're going to grow old together. His words echoed in Siri's ears, but the memory of them only served to deepen her despair over his death. Liar! She bellowed, surprising the people around her, who didn't know what she was talking about. She bowed her head. I can't believe I fell for his lies. It was at that moment, with her eyes cast toward the floor, that Siri felt someone lift her chin. She looked up and she reeled back with surprise as she saw a familiar pair of brown eyes and a signature smirk she recognized all too well. Siri scanned every inch of the man's body, reaching out her hands to touch him hesitantly. When she realized that the man was real, living flesh and blood, she blinked a few times unable to believe the evidence before her eyes. It was as if nothing had happened. She hesitantly pronounced his name. Alan? Sweetie. A soft smile was tugging at the corners of Alan's lips. Siri's eyebrows arched in disbelief. But weren't you dead? I held your cold and lifeless body in my hands. Alan grinned and touched her nose. Maybe I really am dead. Or maybe I'm just a figment of your imagination. Siri extended a hand and touched his face. His warmth coursed through her and her heart leaped upwards with joy. I can touch you. You're real. Of course you can, silly. Siri was overcome with happiness and began to weep again. But this time they were tears of joy. Alan's heart shattered upon seeing his wife's tears. He pulled her into a hug. Siri hugged him back with all the strength she could muster, as if she was afraid of losing him again. And in truth, she was afraid. Afraid that everything was just an illusion, and that Alan would evaporate the moment she let go of him. Siri's tears soaked his shirt as she breathed in Alan's scent. It took everything Alan had to pull out of her hug and trail his fingers under her eyes to wipe away her tears. Sweet little ugly thing, he teased. Through her tears, Siri rolled her eyes. Who are you calling ugly? Alan grinned happily and grasped her cheeks with both hands. 
Have you forgotten what I told you at our third meeting? Siri knitted her brows in thought, causing Alan to smile with renewed passion. You're beautiful when you laugh, and on that occasion, I told you that you should laugh more often. Siri smiled softly at the memory of the loving words. You see, sweetie, it's not so hard to smile. Smiling is the easiest thing in the world. They gazed into each other's eyes for what seemed like an eternity before Siri again began to disbelieve what was happening. You're not real. You're dead. This is all just a hallucination, she whispered, her voice thick with sadness. Well, maybe. Or maybe this is all taking place within your subconscious. Or maybe it's your mind's way of preventing you from accepting the truth. Who knows? Siri was dumbstruck at his comments and just stared with her mouth open as Alan continued to speak. Wifey, I didn't realize you loved me this much, and I have to admit that I'm happy to learn the extent of your love. I guess my patience and endless love paid off. Oh, and let's not forget the great sex. He gave her a subtle wink. Siri snickered. Just as shameless as always, she thought. And now I can die peacefully, Alan said, his lips forming a smile of infinite sadness. Siri looked aghast at these words. But you can't leave me. You promised me that we would grow old together. I never said that I would leave you. I will always be with you. In here. Alan pointed a finger at her chest. I'll be there, always and forever. Siri was frozen to the spot and her mind went blank. She couldn't move or speak, but she saw the intense emotion in his eyes. It made her heart skip a beat. I will always love you, sweetie. Even death can't stop me from loving you. And with that he was gone, leaving Siri alone on the cold floor. She opened her mouth to let air in as her shoulders shook with sorrow. Tears and then more tears fell on her already wet cheeks as she whimpered with uncontrollable grief. Please, please don't leave me, she begged, but it was no use. Everything inside her shut down. Don't leave me, I love you. Darkness closed in around her. Siri! Her father lunged and caught her head before it could hit the floor. While asleep, Siri had a beautiful dream in which she was watching the sunset with Alan. Her head was resting on his shoulder as the chilly wind blew her hair. Alan put his arm around her and they silently gazed upon the awe-inspiring gift of nature. It was the mellow voice of a child that broke the tranquility. Mom, I'm hungry. A girl of about three years of age ran towards them. Alan picked her up and placed her on his lap, ruffling her hair. Go call your brother, then we'll eat. Dad, can I have a chocolate after dinner? Siri opened her mouth to say no, but Alan interrupted her. Yes, of course. My little princess can have anything she wants. The child beamed and ran away to call her brother. Siri was critical. You spoil her too much. Alan merely chuckled and kissed her. If I don't spoil my daughter, who will? Siri couldn't help but smile. As soon as she felt someone planting a kiss on her forehead, Siri opened her eyes and saw a pair of warm eyes staring down at her. Episode 127 Never Again Sweetie, you finally woke up. Siri shook her head and opened her eyes. It was an extremely handsome man looking at her, but one whose face was bruised and lips were pale. Siri traced her finger up to his forehead, which was covered by a bandage that had been wrapped around his head. She blinked as she looked at the man without uttering a sound. Have I been hallucinating again? She wondered. The man trembled slightly as she trailed her finger over his face, lips, and jaw, and finally cupped his cheeks in her hand. Alan flashed a smile and grabbed her hand pressing his lips against her palm. I missed you, sweetie, he whispered, gazing tenderly into her eyes. He gripped her hand tightly and brought it to rest against his heart. The rhythm of Alan's heart beating fully brought Siri out of her stupor. Alan? Her voice was faint but discernible. 
She searched in his eyes for signs that what was taking place was just an illusion, but all she saw was love and affection. I missed you, wifey, Alan said, and as soon as she heard his voice and his personal term of endearment for her, Ciri's heart started beating harder than ever. Are we... in hell? She asked dazedly. Alan's smile froze briefly before he burst into laughter. Hell? Aren't we? Alan placed a hand on Ciri's forehead to see if she was burning with fever, but her temperature felt normal. What would make you think we're in hell? Ciri frowned and looked around her. She was lying on a white clinical bed with an IV drip beside her, but the rest of the decoration and furniture in the room told her that she was not in a hospital, or in hell, come to that. Alan! She whimpered once again. Sweetie, tell me what's wrong. Alan's voice was laced with concern as he saw the bewildered look in her eyes. Siri's response was frantic. Aren't you dead? How are you still alive? Am I going crazy? Am I dreaming still? How long have I been unconscious? Tears welled up in her eyes as she desperately sought an answer, and Alan felt his heart clench with sadness as he saw her confusion. He stroked her face and pressed a kiss on her forehead. No, you're not hallucinating, sweetie. I'm really here. In response, Siri sat up abruptly and flung her hand forward as hard as possible, slapping it across Alan's face. What the? He exclaimed. Siri was surprised at how much her hand hurt after striking her husband. She looked up to see shock and confusion on Alan's face. Despite the pain and amazement he felt, Alan again reached out to stroke his beloved's cheek. Sweetie, I thought you'd be happy to see me alive. Is this how you greet your husband after he's escaped the jaws of death? So you're real, and I'm not dreaming or hallucinating, Siri said meditatively. Wow, you're even scarier than your father. That made Siri jerk up her head. You met my father? Some instinct made Siri glance across to the door. She saw her father leaning against the frame, his arms folded across his chest. Upon meeting eyes with his daughter, Mason smiled softly and nodded gently before leaving the room to give the couple some time alone. When she realized that her father had also seen Alan alive, Siri finally accepted that it was true. You're alive! You're alive! Oh, Alan, I'm so unbelievably happy. I thought you'd never wake up again and that I was going to be left all on my own. I was afraid that my bad luck had caught up with me. Alan pulled her into his arms, hugging her tightly as if to engulf her body in his. Siri felt calm and secure, pressed against the strong pulse of his heartbeat, while Alan kissed the top of her head and whispered into her hair. Wifey, you've suffered so much. I'm so, so sorry that I didn't take care of myself and that I caused you all these problems. I missed you too, Alan. I thought I'd never see your beautiful face again or be able to hold you in my arms. I was so scared. I was broken. Sweetie, I'd have done anything to get you back. I'd have sold my soul to the devil. Alan didn't know it, but that's exactly what had happened. I'll never leave you again, wifey, he said. Like I promised you before, we'll grow old together and watch the stars together at night. Never leave me again, Alan. I don't know if I'd be able to take it. Siri said weakly as tears raced down her cheeks. Alan kissed the tears to wipe them from her face before crushing his lips onto hers. It was a hard kiss driven by a desperate need. Siri felt a shiver run down her spine. This kiss feels somehow different, she thought. It was filled with so much emotion that Siri thought it would consume her. But Alan then deepened the kiss. A kiss full of hope and love. It's beautiful, isn't it? Edward spun around when he heard the deep voice behind him and stepped back in fear when he saw who it was. Never before in his life had he really experienced fear, but something about this man made him nervous. If he hadn't heard Siri address him as father, he would have never believed that she could be his daughter. How can such a young and attractive man be a father? He wondered. Without a doubt, this was the most beautiful man he had ever seen. There was no other word to describe him. 
His presence and temperament made him seem otherworldly, and Edward felt a strong urge to kneel in front of him. For the first time, he realized that there were incredibly powerful beings on the planet. No, Edward thought. This man is definitely not from here. What's beautiful? He asked hesitantly. Young love, it's so full of hope and happiness, Mason said with a broad smile. He had met very few people who had instantly commanded his respect, but this young man and his daughter's husband were two of them. Edward felt a pang of loneliness at Mason's words. Don't be sad or jealous, Mason said sympathetically. You'll find love too, very soon, and the lucky woman will bring light into your dark, lonely world. For the life of him, he didn't know why, but Edward couldn't help but believe Mason. He felt sure that this man knew and could see through everything. With that, Mason went back into the room where the recent events had taken place. A doctor walked in at that point to take care of Siri, shortly followed by the other doctors. It seemed as if they had no knowledge of what had taken place. All they remembered was that they had operated on Alan but to no avail, because the poison had spread to his heart, resulting in his death. Edward squinted when he heard the doctors, but said nothing. Having entered the room earlier, he had seen what Siri had done to them, so he sat down to wait. Half an hour later, Mason left the room. His skin was pale and sweat was dripping down his face. Edward's first instinct was to ask if he was okay, but then he saw Alan behind him. His dead friend was suddenly awake, and he knew that this man must have had something to do with it. Feeling that Alan might be suffering from memory loss or a concussion, Edward asked the doctors to perform a series of tests. Alan protested that he was fine, but he agreed when he saw Edward's determined expression. The tests were done quickly and the results were positive. Upon seeing them, Edward turned back to Mason. Who are you? He tried to look the man in the eyes, but realized that he couldn't do it, no matter how hard he tried. Mason grinned. Oh, I'm just a father who would do anything for his daughter. Edward knew that there was more to the story, but said nothing. Mason continued. I'm the devil. Some call me Satan, others Lucifer. Or they just refer to me as a demon or something. I have a lot of names, to be honest. Edward's eyes widened in terror, and a shiver ran down his spine. Really? Upon seeing his expression, Mason threw his head back and roared with laughter. He strode toward him and bent his head until his eyes were looking directly into Edward's. Do you still believe in those old wives' tales they tell to scare children? Anyway, it was nice to meet you, and I hope we meet again before long. And with that, he was gone. Edward looked all around him, but could no longer see the mysterious stranger. As soon as Mason reappeared in his office, he let out the breath he was holding and rubbed his temples, before coughing up some blood and gripping his stomach with pain. Are you okay, sir? Michael asked. Mason was able to gasp out a final order before he collapsed. Protect her. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction, and Mason had paid the supreme price for the supreme love he held for his daughter. Episode 128 A Slave for Six Months? Siri rested her head on Alan's chest, listening to his heartbeat as he leaned against the headboard. She was enormously grateful to have him back. It was such a relief that the love of her life was again by her side. All she knew was that she never wanted to experience such soul crushing pain again the pain and fear of life without Alan. It would be unthinkable not to have him kiss her good morning and tell her that she was beautiful every day. The heart-wrenching emptiness that had consumed her earlier had nearly driven her out of her mind. Alan stroked her hair as they basked in this delicious moment together. When you've escaped death, every second becomes a luxury that money can't buy. Having his wife in his arms gave him a feeling of completeness that engulfed his soul. Siri sighed with contentment at the closeness between them and the warmth radiating from Alan's body. She breathed in deeply the familiar scent of her husband, and tears pooled in her eyes. Never leave me again, Alan. I don't think I could live without you. No matter the obstacles we face, you can't leave me again. 
Alan heaved a sigh. A trace of sadness passed through his eyes before he again smiled and rested his chin on top of her head. Never again, sweetie. Siri thought for a second before a mischievous glint shone in her eyes. You promised me that you'd come back safely, but you didn't. What punishment do you think you deserve? I know, I know, Alan murmured, catching Siri's fingers and slipping them between his own. Let me think. I can be your slave for six months. You'll be number one and wield absolute control over me. Or you can spank me now. Just as he spoke, Edward put his head around the door to check up on the reunited couple. Overhearing Alan's daring suggestion, he rolled his eyes. You guys are crazy, he thought, and he smiled as he closed the door gently behind him. The couple were so preoccupied that they didn't notice Edward's brief entrance. Knowing Alan, these two will surely do the deed, Edward mused, and ordered his bodyguard to stand a good distance away from the door to give them space. As he walked away, he took out his phone and contemplated what to tell his friends about everything that had taken place that day. The series of events was entirely beyond human comprehension, and anyway, he didn't want to risk the news leaking out. So he told the doctors to explain Alan's surprising recovery as the normal outcome of the ingestion of a very unusual poison, one that stops the heart from beating for a while, gives the appearance of death, but ultimately results in a full recovery. Even if the doctors didn't believe the story, they wouldn't have the courage to question him. What surprised the doctors when they performed their next checkup on Alan was not the absence of evidence of poisoning, but that there was nothing whatsoever wrong with him. He was extraordinarily healthy, much more so than the average human being. Edward and Alan were also greatly shocked at the test results. All Alan knew was that he was alive purely thanks to his father-in-law, so he didn't ask any further questions. Some things were better left unsaid. Later that day, Edward called his friends, Gary and Henry, launching a conference call to talk to them both at once. Both of them picked up immediately, and both blurted out the same breathless question, panic audible in their voices. Is Alan okay? Gary, the doctor of the group, had further questions. Where is he? Is he in a coma? Has he suffered a traumatic brain injury? No, he's fine. Nothing's wrong with him at all. Gary found it difficult at first to believe that someone who had been involved in a big car accident could be completely unharmed. Let me see him to confirm. Edward snorted. Leave him be. He's making up for lost time with his wife. Are you sure he's all right? Gary asked doubtfully. Absolutely. As soon as he gets up, we can have a video call so you can see him. And should I inform his mother? Edward furrowed his brows. No, if you told her, she'd come over at once. Let's wait until he gets up by himself. With that, the trio of friends ended the call. Siri tightened her fingers as they clasped Alan's hands. But Alan, how did you get into an accident in the first place? Who do I have to kill? As soon as it dawned on her that someone had hurt the man she loved, her blood began to boil. Alan stroked her head gently even as a murderous desire passed through him. He wanted to spend a relaxing moment with his wife, not to think about killing anyone. Sweetie, I'll tell you all about it later. But right now, I just want to spend some quality time with you. He pressed a kiss on the tip of her nose. The kiss was gentle, yet contained many emotions. He looked deeply into her eyes. I was so afraid that I wouldn't see you again. His face betrayed his burning desire for her, while his fingers pushed strands of her hair away from her face, tucking them gently behind her ears. I need you, sweetie. Episode 129 Only Mine Siri saw the desire in Alan's eyes and blushed. Her tongue glided over her bottom lip as her mouth slowly curved into a seductive smile. Alan let out a gasp as he watched her. I need you, he said huskily. All right, Siri said. Alan lowered his head and captured her lips in a slow and tender kiss as his tongue found hers. After a few moments, he broke away and stared at her hungrily. 
he brushed her hair away from her shoulders before leaning in and kissing her ear. His lips traveled down her neck and to her shoulders as his hands gently untied her hospital gown. Siri felt herself shudder under the touch of Alan's lips. His hands moved over her skin, making her shake with desire. She moaned, and her body began to move beneath him. A rush of excitement coursed through Alan, and he inhaled deeply. You're so beautiful, he said as he kissed her again. I love you, darling. He pulled back and looked into her eyes. Siri could see the raw emotion in his stare, and it felt electric. She held her breath as he cupped her face in his hands, his thumbs lightly tracing the shape of her eyebrows. You're absolutely lovely, and you're mine, Alan whispered. I'm yours, and you are mine, Siri said breathlessly. Alan took off his shirt and trousers, and Siri swallowed as she looked at his body. He leaned in and kissed her again, more passionately this time. The intensity grew between them, and Alan held her tightly in his arms. Siri was scared of hurting the burns on his shoulders, but her desire was overwhelming, and she gripped the bedsheets as they made love. Episode 130, A Breakfast for Two Alan lay beside Siri on the bed. His face was the nuzzles into the crook of her neck, and they were both breathing rapidly. They stayed like that for a few minutes as they enjoyed the peaceful silence. After a while, Alan's body relaxed and his breathing steadied. Are you okay, darling? He asked softly. Yeah, I... But she was interrupted by the sound of her stomach rumbling. Alan chuckled, and Siri's face turned red with embarrassment. I'll go find you something to eat, Alan said as he got down from the bed. He picked up his trousers from the floor and put them on. Wait for me here, okay? He said. Siri scrunched up her face and shook her head. No, I want to go with you, she said, pouting. I don't want to be here alone. But the truth was that she was scared Alan wouldn't come back. What if the moment he leaves, I wake up and find this was all a dream? She thought as she looked at him. Alan could see the fear in her eyes, and he didn't try to argue with her. Okay, he said, walking over to the wardrobe. Let me find you some clothes. I'm sure Edward will have some around here. Siri frowned when she saw him pull out a t-shirt and a pair of pants. Here, Alan said, bringing them over to the bed and handing them to her. Siri wrinkled her nose. I don't want to wear another man's clothes, she complained. Alan laughed. These are mine, wifey, and the room is too. Edward bought this place and allocated rooms for us in case we ever came to New York. Oh, Siri said, feeling a little awkward. Yeah, Alan said, nodding. And because I rarely ever come here, the clothes are pretty much brand new. Siri nodded and took them from him. She stayed on the bed as she put them on. When she was done, Alan lifted her into his arms effortlessly. You shouldn't carry me, Siri protested. I can walk, and you just woke up. You have your back injuries. Won't they hurt? She asked worriedly. Don't worry, wifey, Alan said. Your husband is strong, and I like having you in my arms like this. Siri smiled and nestled into his chest. Alan brought her downstairs carefully and headed toward the kitchen. Siri looked around. Alan? She called out quickly. Mm-hmm. Alan replied. Don't you think the bodyguards are giving us some weird looks? Do they know? Yes, Alan interrupted. But you don't have to be shy. This is normal for a married couple. Siri rolled her eyes and ignored him as Alan walked into the kitchen. What would you like to eat? He asked as he set her down on one of the bar stools. I can get the chef to make something for you. I'll eat anything as long as you feed me, Siri replied. Sir, ma'am, a voice behind them said. Can I help you with anything? Alan and Siri turned and found an old man standing behind them. He was waiting patiently for their reply. Yes, Alan said with a polite smile. Please, could you make some oatmeal for my wife? Of course, sir, the man replied. Twenty minutes later, the chef brought over a steaming bowl of oatmeal. 
Alan took a spoonful and blew on it gently before turning to Siri with a soft smile. Open your mouth, he said. Siri obediently did as she was told as if she were a child. It didn't take long for her to finish. Alan ruffled her hair playfully. Good girl, he teased. Do you want some more? Siri blinked and nodded, and he signaled to the chef. Alan kept his eyes on her as they waited for more oatmeal. He had found out what Siri had done when she had heard he was dead and the distress that she had experienced. He knew that because of him, his wife had revealed her secret. She had risked her life to save his, and he was sure that if the news got out about her abilities, powerful people would come for her. People always feared the unknown, and Alan knew they wouldn't stop until they got rid of it. Fortunately, Edward had been the one to witness everything. Alan knew he was the one person he could trust to protect his wife and keep everything a secret. The chef brought over another bowl of oatmeal and Alan took it. Once again, he picked up a spoonful and held it to Siri's mouth. She opened it slightly, but before she could take a bite, Alan quickly kissed her and put the spoon in his own mouth. Siri was caught off guard and she gasped. Alan sat back and smirked at her. That's some very tasty oatmeal, wifey. Siri blushed and glared at him. But before she could complain, Alan brought another spoonful to her mouth. She went to take a bite, but he did the same thing again. Alan alternated between feeding himself and feeding Siri until the bowl was finished. Edward arrived just in time to see the last few bites. Seriously? He said as he stood behind them and rolled his eyes. You two can't keep your hands off each other, and now you're practically eating from each other's mouths. You don't have to be that gross. Alan could hear the disgust in Edward's voice, and he turned around to glare at him. You're just a jealous and lonely ass, he said. Whatever, Edward muttered under his breath. Hello, Miss Kenster, he said, looking at Siri. Siri turned around. Hello, Mr. Collins. Glad to see you're back on your feet, Edward said before looking at Alan again. Hurry up, we've got to go, he said. Your mom is in a bad way. Alan froze. My mother? What happened to her? He asked, his voice thick with fear. She didn't take the news of your accident well, Edward replied, rubbing the back of his neck. Why did you tell her? Alan cried. You should have kept it from her. Edward sighed loudly. She was the one who called me. She said she was afraid something had happened to you and that we had to look for you. Do you really think we could have lied to her? Alan screwed up his face with worry. Siri placed a hand on his shoulder to try and comfort him. Don't worry, she said. I'm sure Mom will be fine. Alan managed to squeeze out a smile. Yeah, he said. Let's go home. Episode 131 Back from the Dead Don't be stubborn, Anna, David said. If our son were here, do you think he'd be happy with you starving yourself? He was trying to coax his wife, who hadn't eaten or spoken a word since she had woken up. Instead, she was staring at the door as if she was waiting for someone to walk through it. David didn't want to break her heart by telling her their son wasn't coming back. He had died, and there was no way they could revive him, except by selling their soul to the devil. But David knew that wasn't possible when they couldn't even find his body. He looked at the bowl of soup he had prepared and heaved a sigh. He didn't know what he could say or do to get his wife to eat. He put the bowl down on the table and looked up at the ceiling. Do you remember the day you gave birth to Alan? He said after thinking for a moment. You were disappointed at first because you had wanted a daughter. His lips stretched into a sad smile. You even refused to hold him at first but I still remember the smile on your face when you gave in and took him. You said our son was special, and from then on, you doted on him. Anna looked at her husband for the first time since she had woken up that morning. David continued, I remember how you would argue with the other parents when Alan got into a fight. You used to blame them for not raising their kids properly. He was like a saint in your eyes. He could do nothing wrong. I was even jealous of my son sometimes. He had stolen all of my wife's love and attention from me. Anna started to smile sadly as she listened to her husband talk. Do you remember that time you got sick? 
Alan sat by your side all night. He was only eight years old, but he never left you. I came back from my business trip and found him taking care of you. That was when I realized why you loved your son so much. David's eyes glinted with sadness as the memory flooded his mind. Do you remember what he said? I do. He said, Mommy, you have to eat so you can get better soon. If you die or something happens to you, your little Alan will be lonely and sad. Do you want your little Alan to be sad? Eat a little, Mommy, just for me. I still remember the way he was smiling at you, and then you ate all the oatmeal he gave you. And after he finished, do you remember the promise you made him? He wiped your lips and lay down next to you, and he said, Mommy, promise me that no matter how sick you are, you will keep eating, or I'll be sad. Food is so yummy, so why don't you want to eat? It gives you energy so you can get better, and then you could teach me piano. Don't you want to teach me how to play the piano? Anna let out a loud sob, and her hands shook as she covered her face. Why? Why is life so unfair? She said, her voice hoarse. I can't imagine my life without him. I know I will wake up every morning and realize my little Alan isn't around anymore. He's not going to be here when I grow old. First it was Tom, and now Alan. Both of them died in car accidents, and we don't have either of their bodies. Is this a curse? Tears were streaming down her face, and she could feel herself collapsing. David pulled her into his arms. He could only hold her as she sobbed into his chest. He knew he had to be strong for his wife. He had walled his emotions off to help him cope, but his eyes were heavy with unshed tears. He clenched his shaking fists in a desperate battle against his grief. His wife's sobs echoed in the room, and he felt his heart shattering. After a moment, Anna calmed down and pulled away from him. Alan will say I look ugly now, she said, chuckling humorlessly and wiping away her tears. David looked at her and felt his heart ache even more as he realized his wife was trying to be strong. Where's the soup? She asked, sitting up straighter on the bed. I promised my little Alan that I would eat no matter what happens. I, I need to eat or my son will tell me off when I meet him again in heaven. She was rambling a little, and David's lips twisted into a forced smile as he picked the bowl up. He took a spoonful and brought it to her lips. Anna opened her mouth, and the minute she tasted it, more tears fell from her eyes. Why are you crying? Do you want to get wrinkles and look old? Someone said. The voice sounded amused as it echoed in the room. David dropped the bowl of soup, and it fell to the floor. Easy, old man the voice said. David's hands trembled as he pointed at the figure leaning against the door. You look like you've seen a ghost, Dad. Alan chuckled as he strode toward his parents. He pulled his father forward and hugged him. The wall David had put up against his emotions cracked, and a tear rolled down his cheek and fell on Alan's shirt. Well, would you look at that? The CEO known for his cold heart has just shed a tear. Alan said jokingly in an attempt to lighten the mood. David's lips twisted into a smile before he hit Alan on the arm. You silly boy, you've made your mother cry. Go and apologize, he said, winking at his son. Alan ran to the bed and pretended to hide behind Anna. Save me, mother. He's scary, he pleaded. David walked over and hit him a few more times playfully, but Anna was in a daze and said nothing. Any other day, she would have told her husband off for laying a hand on her precious son. But not that day. David noticed her silence and stopped. He looked at his son. Alan got off the bed and kneeled down in front of his mother. Mom, he said gently. It was just one word, but it was enough to break her. A wave of painful emotions slammed through Anna's body. Episode 132, A Monster Anna slowly looked at her son. Her hands shook as she raised them up and cupped Alan's face. He smiled and leaned into his mother's palms. Mom, 
Anna's stomach and throat tightened as soon as she heard her son's voice. She was overcome with fear. She wanted to ask how and why he was there, but she couldn't. Tears filled her eyes once more, but they were no longer to mourn her son's death. Instead, she was crying because something seemed wrong. Anna could still sense the emptiness inside, and she thought fate was playing a trick on her. It felt like an overwhelming amount of nothingness pulsing in her very soul. And yet at the same time, she could feel the weight of the world on her heart. She was a mother who had lost both of her sons, and she had been taken over by a numbness that made her lips tremble so much she had to bite them. Please say something, Alan said as Anna stared at him without saying a word. He was starting to panic and he looked at his father for help. Honey, David said as he placed his hand gently on his wife's shoulder. It's our son. He's not dead, see? He's alive. Mom, are you okay? Alan asked, his voice filled with concern. Anna nodded slowly as the mist cleared in her mind. Finally, she smiled. My little Alan is really alive, she said as she turned to look at her husband. Yes, your little Alan is alive, Alan said, relieved. How can I die? I still haven't taken you for a walk along the beach when you get old. Alan smiled, and Anna began laughing and crying at the same time as she was filled with joy and relief. She turned to David and grasped his hand that was still resting on her shoulder. Alan wiped the tears from her face and kissed her cheeks. Sorry I worried you, Mom, he mumbled. You're back, Anna replied. That's the most important thing. Where's Siri? You should call her. I'm sure she must be worried about not hearing from you. She said anxiously. She's here, Mom. Alan replied quickly, pointing. Look. Siri was standing at the door. She felt like she was intruding on their joyful reunion, and she fidgeted awkwardly. Mom, she managed to say as she squeezed out a smile. Anna frowned when she saw her daughter-in-law. Siri's eyes were puffy, and Anna thought she had lost weight. Siri, she said. What's happened to you? Come here, and let Mom take a look at you. Siri walked toward them. Dad, she said, looking at David. He nodded and smiled softly at her. Alan stood up and sat down next to his mother on the bed. Are you okay, Siri? Anna asked, concerned. Why are your eyes puffy? I'm fine, Mom. It's just... Siri trailed off. She didn't want to tell Anna that Alan had died and that she had nearly killed a team of doctors because of her rage. Were you scared something had happened to Alan? Anna asked. Yeah, Siri nodded. He wasn't picking up any of my calls and I couldn't reach him. I thought something had happened, but thankfully he's okay. She looked at Alan, who was staring at her intently. Anna nodded. Alan... Now you're back. Go home with Siri and rest. We can talk tomorrow. She desperately wanted her son to stay, but she knew the young couple needed some time together. She was worried Siri would misunderstand the situation, and she wanted Alan to have a chance to explain things. Anna took Alan's hand and squeezed it gently. She leaned over and whispered in his ear, Make sure you reassure Siri. A wife can get very worried if she doesn't hear from her husband for days especially when she's scared something has happened to him. She turned to Siri and smiled. Alan nodded and stood up. I'll see you tomorrow, Mom. All right, Anna replied. Remember what I told you. Alan nodded again and said goodbye to his father before walking out of the room with Siri. They went downstairs and found Gary and Henry standing in the lounge. Alan hadn't noticed them when he had arrived. He had been worried about his mother and had gone straight to his parents' room. He looked at his friends and noticed their eyes were puffy, and they had dark circles underneath. What happened to you guys? He said, raising his eyebrows. You look awful. Edward was also in the lounge, and he rolled his eyes as he leaned against the couch. Alan, Henry said as he rushed over and hugged him. I was so scared, I thought I wouldn't see you again. He stepped back, and Alan frowned when he saw tears rolling down his friend's cheeks. You're crying because you thought I was dead? He asked awkwardly. Yes. Henry nodded. Oh, Alan said, turning to look at Edward. 
He was pretty messed up when he got the news about your accident, Edward replied, shrugging. He was staring at Siri, who was standing beside Alan. Siri could feel his eyes on her, and she returned his gaze. She could see that he was curious and knew he had questions, but she ignored him and looked away. Alan patted Henry's shoulder. I'm here now, he said. Don't worry. Henry nodded and wiped away his tears. Alan was touched by the actions of his friends. Never in his wildest dreams did he think that if something were to happen to him, Henry would cry about it. Nor did he think Edward would lose his temper when he was usually so calm or that Gary would look after his wife. He smiled at his friends. I'd love to catch up with you, but my wife's a little tired. I'll see you guys later, okay? Gary frowned. Are you sure you're okay, Alan? You don't have a headache or feel any pain at all? Did the doctors do any tests to check? He asked worriedly. He was finding it difficult to believe his friend could recover so quickly. Yeah, Doc, Alan replied with a heavy sigh. I'm fine. I just have the burns on my back, but I'll live. Gary frowned, but he nodded. I'll ask Granddad to give you an ointment that will help make sure you don't scar. All right. Alan nodded. Thank you for everything, guys. Edward rolled his eyes. Just don't make me waste my time again. If you can't protect yourself, you should go back to the army, or I'll let you join my mafia. Yeah, I love you too, Alan jokingly replied. Edward wrinkled his nose in disgust and glanced at Siri. She was glaring at Alan, and it felt like the temperature in the room had dropped. Alan noticed and looked at her. You know I'm joking, wifey, he said quickly. How could I ever love such an ugly man? He pulled Siri into his arms as Edward and Gary shook their heads. Let me take you both home before you make us all throw up, Edward said as he frowned at them. Siri checked the time on their way back and realized it was a quarter past seven in the evening. She knew her grandfather would be worried about her, and she dialed his number as soon as they got home. Norman picked up on the first ring. Grandpa? Siri said quickly. He coughed before replying. Siri, where are you? Are you okay? You said you were going to your in-laws, but you never came back or called me. Is your husband okay? He tried to catch his breath, and Siri felt a pang of guilt in her heart as she heard the distress in his voice. I'm fine, Grandpa, and Alan's fine too. I came back to our place with him, she explained. That's good, Norman replied. As long as you're okay, remember to take care of yourself. All right, Grandpa, Siri answered. See you tomorrow. Okay, Norman said. Siri hung up the phone and rubbed her temples. Alan had been waiting for her to finish. As soon as the receiver was down, he grabbed her shoulders and buried his head into her neck, breathing her in. Are you okay, wifey? He whispered into her ear. Do you have a headache? I'm fine, Siri chuckled. It's just been a rough couple of hours. Aren't you going to ask me how I found you? Or why does my father look so young? Or how he was able to bring you back? Don't you want to know? No. Alan replied, shaking his head. I know you have your reasons for hiding all of this. You revealed your secret because of me. I'm really sorry, darling. He turned her around and Siri stared into his eyes. Aren't you... aren't you afraid of me? She asked. I'm a monster. Alan laughed. Yes, you're a monster. But you're a beautiful monster, and you're mine he said as he gently tapped the end of her nose. My beautiful monster. He whispered as he kissed her lips. Episode 133, Playing with Fire. Thank you, darling, Alan mumbled. Siri could feel his breath on her skin as he traced her face with his fingers, moving from her forehead to the tip of her nose to her soft lips. You saved me. No, Siri said, shaking her head. My father saved you. And why did he save me? Alan asked. Because you're the man his daughter is madly in love with. Siri chuckled. And I'm madder about you, Alan grinned. Siri rolled her eyes, but a smile tugged at her lips. Ever since I saw you in that red suit at the club, I've been mad about you. 
Alan said. I can't get you out of my head. Siri looked at him. She felt like she was in a daze, and her heart slammed hard against her chest. Only he could make her feel such a rush of emotions all at once. That's good then, she whispered. At least I'm not the only one mad in this relationship. Alan's grin became wider. Shall we take a bath? He asked as he nuzzled into her neck. Mm-hmm, but no tricks, Siri said with a stern expression. I can't promise anything, Alan said, laughing. Wait, Siri said. They've bandaged your burns. I thought they can't touch water. Oh, I forgot, Alan replied. I guess you'll have to help me then. Siri let out a long and exhausted sigh. Okay, I'll go get what we need. Wait for me in the bathroom, she said as she walked out of the room. She came back a few minutes later carrying a wooden stool. She placed it in the middle of the floor. This will do, she said. Sit. Alan undressed and sat down. Siri's fingers touched his back. Even though she couldn't see his wounds, she felt her heart aching as she looked at the bandages. Does it hurt? She asked softly. Alan shook his head. Even if it did, my wifey would make it better, right? Siri nodded. If I find the person who did this to you... But Alan pulled her onto his lap. Siri blushed. I don't want you to get your hands dirty, darling. Alan said. I'll find whoever it was, and I'll make sure he experiences hell on earth. Siri frowned and shook her head. No, I won't rest until I've made him suffer, myself. Alan could see the look of determination in her eyes as she spoke, and he knew it came from the pain and fear of losing him that she would forever carry in her heart. He realized he needed to let her vent. Okay, he said. We'll find the person together. Perfect, Siri beamed as a dangerous glint flashed across her eyes. She planted a kiss on Alan's cheeks before standing up. So, who helped you take a bath in New York? She asked as she picked up a towel and soaked it in water. Edward, Alan whispered. Siri frowned. Even though he was just a friend, she didn't like the idea of anyone else touching her husband. Alan could see the expression of distaste on her face, and he laughed. Wifey, you're becoming more and more possessive every day. Don't tell me you're jealous. No, Siri replied quickly. Alan watched as she pursed her lips together annoyed. Okay, he said. I won't let anyone else touch me again without your permission. How's that? Good, Siri answered. Alan leaned over and placed a kiss on her nose before finding her lips. My possessive wife, he murmured as a slow smile appeared on his face. So sexy. Siri smiled back as she began to wipe his body with a towel. She focused on his chest and arms first. Once she had finished, she stopped and fidgeted for a moment. She glanced at his face and saw the look of amusement. Hurry up, wifey, he said, his eyes sparkling. He was clearly enjoying her discomfort. Siri blushed and turned away. Even though they had been intimate, she still felt awkward being so close to him when she didn't have her desire to guide her. Alan grinned at her. You don't need to be shy, wifey. It's nothing you haven't seen before. Siri's cheeks became redder as she took a risk and glanced between his legs. Shut up! She snapped as she tried to hide her embarrassment. Alan's amused laugh echoed in the bathroom. Why? He said innocently. It's not like I'm lying. He paused for a moment and looked at her. I forgot how innocent you are sometimes, he said quietly. Siri squeezed her eyes shut. She knew Alan was taunting her, and there was no way she was going to let him win. She opened her eyes again, and they gleamed with determination and mischief. Alan smiled. There's my spitfire. Siri washed the rest of his body, taking her time and teasing him every chance she got. You're cruel. Alan said. What? She asked innocently. Alan shook his head and sighed helplessly. Nothing, he said. Siri shrugged and nodded. Don't play with fire, she teased, or else you'll get burned. She helped Alan put on his pajamas. 
I'm going to go have a shower, she said after they had finished. Wait for me. She came back a few minutes later with a towel wrapped around her and her hair dripping wet. Alan swallowed as he felt himself becoming warm, but he tried to control himself. He took a deep breath and frowned. Come here, he said as he beckoned toward her. Let me help you dry your hair. Siri walked over and handed him another towel. Alan gently squeezed the last few drops of water out of her hair before getting the blow dryer. After he had finished, Siri changed into her nightgown and went over to the bed. Because of his burns, Alan had to sleep on his stomach and he lay his head on Siri's chest. He had never understood why she had been so obsessed with listening to his heart beating. But at that moment, he started to understand. There was something calming and almost divine about listening to the heart of the person you love and hearing its rhythm as it beats for you too. Good night, wifey. He whispered softly. Night, night. Siri replied as she planted a kiss on his forehead. She breathed in Alan's scent and quickly fell asleep. Without him by her side, the nights had been sleepless and hard. But now that she had him back, it was the most peaceful she had felt in days. Alan's lips curved into a smile. He had his wife in his arms again. Or rather, his wife had him in her arms, and he couldn't possibly complain about a thing. He listened to her breathing and could tell she had fallen asleep. When tomorrow comes, I'm going to find the person responsible for all of this. And when I do... But Alan didn't finish his thought. His smile turned into an evil smirk as sleep consumed him too. The happy couple slept peacefully in each other's arms, unaware that somewhere else a storm was brewing. The man looked at his subordinates as they shook in front of him. A flash of disdain filled his eyes. I gave you one job, he bellowed angrily. One, and you failed. How did he survive? No one can survive that poison, but you're telling me that man did? His voice sent shivers through the spines of his men, and they trembled as their hearts hammered against their chests. They knew that when their boss was angry, people died. Their legs gave out, and they kneeled on the ground. Boss, the leader of the team said. We were sure he would die. We don't know how or why he's alive. The poison weakened him, and our car did enough damage to kill him. There's no way he's still breathing. The leader had been confident that Alan had no chance of surviving. He had thrown him into a place where no one would see him because no one ever went through there. He was sure Alan would rot and die. That was why he hadn't killed him outright. He wanted Alan to die a slow and painful death, and he was sure the crows would have fed on his body. But now he was being told he was alive, and he couldn't understand it. Unless he isn't human, he thought. Episode 134 a father's love. Siri followed Alan into a room. Inside, a man who looked to be about 40 years old was tied to a chair in the center of the room. Next to him was a long rectangular table. A man dressed in military attire stood over him and was punching the man in the face. He stopped when he saw Alan walk in. Boss, he said. Mr. Andre looked up from the chair. At first, he had thought that Alan's poisoner must have been responsible for ambushing him on his way back from work. But now, from the obsequious tone of voice of the man who had been hitting him, he knew that the person behind his kidnapping had just walked in. He swallowed nervously when he saw Alan standing in front of him, emotionless. Mr. Mr. Wellesley, he stuttered. He realized that Alan was going to get his revenge and there was nothing he could do to stop him. Alan ignored Andre and instead pulled out a chair from the table. Sit down, darling, he said to Siri. She looked at Alan and nodded before taking a seat. Are you sad that I'm alive? Alan asked as he took a step closer to Mr. Andre. He bent down so that he was face to face with him. Mr. Andre looked at Alan. He was breathless from the beating he had received, but he tried to speak. No, I'm happy you're alive. I, I was afraid that something had happened to you. I haven't been able to sleep these past few days. My conscience wouldn't let me. I, I'm sorry. Alan raised his eyebrows as he listened. So, you're admitting that you're the one who poisoned me? No, I mean yes, but it wasn't me. Mr. Andre replied quickly. We've been in business such a long time. You know I would never hurt anyone. I was forced to. 
Alan turned to look at Siri. She was sitting silently with one leg crossed over the other. Her face gave nothing away, and none of the men knew what she was thinking. Mr. Andre watched Alan and realized he hadn't yet decided on what he was going to do to him. I was going to come to Boston personally to sign the deal, he added desperately. But three days ago, I went to pick up my daughter from school when a man approached me. He, he used my daughter to threaten me. He said they had taken my daughter, and if I wanted her to live, I had to follow his instructions exactly. I, I was afraid. You know I'm all she has. Her mother died when she gave birth, and my daughter has a heart problem. She grew up with a congenital heart disease. I... Mr. Andre burst into tears before he could finish. He took a deep breath and tried to continue. He told me to tell you to come to New York. I, I didn't know why until he gave me the pen. He told me I should make sure you use it to sign the contract when we met. I didn't know what was so special about the pen, but I knew it wasn't anything good. I, I, I wanted to warn you, but I couldn't. They were going to kill my daughter. My daughter. She's all I have. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. Siri began to laugh hysterically. Touching, she said sarcastically. So, you chose to murder someone's husband in exchange for your daughter? I, I'm not lying. I really had no choice. I was desperate. A desperate father. Mr. Andre cried. Siri looked at Mr. Andre sitting in front of her. Usually, she would torture her prey. She would play with them before she inflicted any pain on them. But deep in her heart, she knew she couldn't kill this man. She could tell he was telling the truth and that he was just a father protecting his sick daughter. And she didn't want to deprive a child of its dad. But Siri didn't know if she could just let him go. No, she thought. I'm going to make him feel the same emotions and pain I felt when I held Alan's cold and lifeless body in my arms. I'm going to make him scream for death, but I won't give it to him. After all, sometimes emotional pain is a lot worse than physical pain. Siri calmly stood up. She began to hum a tune as she slowly walked toward Mr. Andre. He could see the ruthlessness in her eyes, and he began to shake. He could tell she was deadly. Siri's lips stretched into an evil smile. Do you know what is more painful than death? She asked as she leaned against the table. I... no, please, Mr. Andre pleaded. To hold the cold and lifeless body of the person you love in your hands, Siri said. To know you won't see him again, you won't hear his laugh. It's like someone ripping your heart from your chest. Have you ever experienced that? Mr. Andre's eyes widened with fear as he shook his head aggressively. Please, please spare my daughter. Siri narrowed her eyes and tutted. Why would I spare your daughter? Did you spare my husband? Alan frowned as he listened to Siri. He had seen Mr. Andre's daughter once, and he had to admit that he was fond of the little girl. He didn't want his wife to be so heartless that she would kill a child. Alan was ruthless as well, but he didn't kill or destroy people without good reason. He knew Mr. Andre had done what he had had to do to save his daughter, and Alan would have done the same thing. Siri glanced at Alan and saw the worried expression etched onto his face. Do you trust me? She asked. Alan turned to look at her. He nodded. Yes. He said, always. Siri smiled. Then leave us alone. Alan froze for a moment. He didn't want to leave her by herself with Mr. Andre, and he definitely didn't want his wife to get her hands dirty in any way. He didn't know what to do. Darling, remember that everyone has a reason for doing something. Before you judge them, put yourself in their shoes. Alan said before walking toward her and planting a kiss on her forehead. Siri understood but said nothing. They both knew Mr. Andre was no more than a pawn in someone else's game. The real danger was somewhere out there, and they would have to find it. I'll be outside if you need me, Alan said as he walked out of the room. The man dressed like a soldier followed him. Siri turned and saw the CCTV camera installed on the wall. Alan had gone straight to the monitor as soon as he had left the room, and he watched as Siri grabbed a towel from the table and threw it over the camera. He frowned. He knew Siri would never forgive herself if she deprived a child of its father, and his plan had been to watch and stop her if she went too far. Inside the room, 
Siri turned and looked at Mr. Andre. Her lips curved into a sinister smile. Let's get started, shall we? She said. Ten minutes later, a heart-wrenching wail came from the room, making Alan freeze. He opened the door and rushed inside, but he stopped short when he saw the scene in front of him. He was speechless. After a moment, he spoke. What did you do to him? Episode 135 Cooking with Mom What did you do to him? Alan asked. Although Mr. Andre was a grown man, he was crying like a little child. He seemed to be in immense pain and looked like he had experienced an unimaginable loss. Siri turned to look at Alan and shrugged. Nothing, she said. I just gave him a taste of what it feels like to hold the cold and lifeless body of his loved one in his hands. Alan scrunched up his face, confused. Mr. Andre's wails and cries were heartbreaking to listen to. He was sitting on the floor with tears streaming down his cheeks. He was saying something incoherently, but Alan could tell he was crying for his daughter. He's just hallucinating, Siri said when she saw Alan's frown. He'll be fine. Okay, Alan said. From what he said before, it looks like someone else is behind all of this. Siri nodded. You have to be careful from now on. I can't afford to lose you again, she said softly. Alan's lips stretched into a smile, and he nodded. All right, he said. I will. Siri returned a nod before turning to look at Mr. Andre. What will you do with him? She asked Alan quietly. Nothing, Alan replied. I'm fond of his daughter, and I can't bring myself to hurt him. The truth is... I would have done the same thing if I were in his shoes. Siri scoffed. Aren't you supposed to be ruthless? That's what all the rumors say. Alan chuckled. I am, he said, playfully ruffling her hair. But I don't go around killing innocent people or destroying their lives because I'm bored. I only do that to the ones who deserve it. Siri frowned but said nothing. Let's go, Alan said. Mom's waiting for us. All right, Siri replied. When they arrived at the Wellesley house, Anna was in the kitchen, and Siri went to see if she needed any help. Mom, she said as she walked in. Anna smiled affectionately at her. How are you? She asked as she studied her daughter-in-law. She noticed Siri's worried frown and made a mental note to tell her son to make sure he was taking care of his wife. I'm fine, Mom, Siri replied. Anna nodded. We're having Italian tonight. Do you know how to make ravioli? Siri blushed and shook her head awkwardly. Anna chuckled. Don't worry, dear. I'll teach you. Siri nodded and washed her hands at the sink. After she was done, she went and stood by Anna. At first, she was clumsy and couldn't figure out how to do it. But Anna was patient, and she laughed kindly as she showed her how to place the perfect amount of filling on the pasta and seal it securely. After a few minutes, Siri started to get the hang of it. Anna watched her as she worked. She noticed that the filling was leaking in a few places and her lips twitched. But she looked at Siri and smiled encouragingly. I have a pretty smart daughter-in-law, don't I? She said. Siri looked at the leaking pasta and blushed with embarrassment at Anna's compliment. She knew her mother-in-law didn't want her to feel bad. So, how's work been, dear? Anna asked as Siri started on another sheet of pasta. It must have been hard when you were so worried about Alan. It's going well, Siri said. I'm about to launch a new collection. She smiled as she spoke. Anna's eyes lit up as she looked at Siri proudly. That's great. You're so good at what you do. I know it'll be a hit. Siri nodded. Thanks, Mom, she said, still smiling. Cassandra was feeling bored that day and decided to visit her aunt. When she got to Anna's house, she found Alan standing in front of his car outside. He was talking to someone on the phone. She quietly crept up behind him. Boo! She shouted. Alan calmly hung up the phone and turned around to look at her nonchalantly. Seriously? He said, playfully tapping Cassandra on the forehead. Cassandra pouted. You're no fun. Alan shrugged and gently patted her head with a chuckle. How are you, kiddo? 
Cassandra frowned and crossed her arms across her chest. Stop calling me that. I'm not a kid. Alan rolled his eyes. Why are you here? Don't you have school? I'm fine because I want to be. And yes, I do have class, but I ditched it. Cassandra replied with a smirk. Hmm, Alan replied. Come on, let's go inside. Cassandra raised her eyebrows. She was sure Alan was going to scold her, but she was surprised that he hadn't. Is your wife here? She asked. As soon as Alan nodded, Cassandra ran into the house. She had wanted to meet Siri after her company called her, but she had never gotten the chance. She called out for her aunt and heard Anna's voice coming from the kitchen. Cassandra walked in and found Siri with her head down. She seemed to be concentrating hard on whatever it was she was doing. She had flour on her face and was wrapping something up on the counter. Anna smiled when she saw her niece. Cassandra, she said. How are you? I'm fine, Auntie Anna, Cassandra replied. Siri looked up when she heard Cassandra's voice and smiled softly. Cassandra blushed. She had rushed in to ask Siri why she had chosen her as an ambassador for her new collection, but now the words felt stuck in her throat. Siri? She managed to say. Siri smiled again and hummed in response. Cassandra glanced around and found Alan standing behind her. He could tell she was nervous and he was laughing. She let out an angry sigh and left the kitchen. Is everything okay? Siri asked when she saw Cassandra leaving. Yes, Alan replied, taking a napkin and wiping the flower from Siri's face. She's just a little shy around you. Siri raised her eyebrows. Cassandra didn't look like someone who would be shy of anyone. Shy of me? She asked. Why? Alan chuckled and shook his head. I don't know, he replied. You can ask her later. Episode 136 You Do Like Her Cassandra, the way you keep stealing glances at my wife is making me think you might really like her, Alan said. His deep voice filled the room and interrupted Anna, who had been talking to Siri as they all sat around the dining table. Cassandra glared at Alan as his lips curved into a mischievous smirk. He turned to Siri, who raised her eyebrows and looked at Cassandra. Cassandra could sense Siri's eyes on her, and her face began to feel hot. No, no! Cassandra snapped at Alan quickly. So, you hate my wife then? Alan replied. He was clearly enjoying teasing his cousin. I... Cassandra trailed off awkwardly. No, I don't hate her. So, you do really like her, Alan continued. Alan! Cassandra shouted. Alan burst out laughing. Don't you get any feelings for my wife, he said. I don't care if you're my cousin. I will literally eat your eyes if you think anything bad about her. Cassandra wrinkled her nose. That's disgusting and creepy. Alan shook his head. Just protecting what's mine. Siri rolled her eyes at Alan before turning to Cassandra. Don't mind him. Is there something you wanted to say? Siri asked softly. She had felt Cassandra's eyes on her all day, and Siri could tell they were filled with curiosity and awe. It was the first time anyone had ever looked at her like that, and it made her feel a little uncomfortable. Um, nothing. Cassandra hesitated. It's just... You are so confident and elegant. Can I... Can we be friends? She was fidgeting as she spoke. It was the first time she had asked someone that, and her palms felt clammy. Alan let out a hearty laugh. Are you sure you're actually Cassandra? Did you hit your head or something? When did you want to be friends with anyone? Cassandra's face burned with embarrassment. Anna was staring at Cassandra as if her niece were an alien. She had noticed how bright Cassandra's eyes were every time she looked at Siri, almost as if a light was shining out of them. Anna knew that, deep down, her niece was still a child, and she was looking for validation from someone she genuinely looked up to. Yes, we can be friends, Siri replied. She could see the pain and hurt flickering in the girl's eyes. She knew that even though Cassandra seemed tough, it was all an act. Really? Cassandra replied. Can we be friends? Siri smiled and nodded. Yeah. Before she knew it, Cassandra was smiling brightly. That moment marked the start of a beautiful friendship between them. So, Cassandra, Siri asked, why aren't you in class? 
It was Wednesday, and Siri was sure school hadn't finished for the day yet. Oh, Cassandra laughed awkwardly. I ditched school. I really hate going to class. Why do I have to go through all that learning? I'd rather drop dead. I don't want to spend all my time reading all those boring medical books. I want to enjoy my life. Siri nodded. And are you enjoying your life? Are you happy? She asked. Cassandra's body grew tense. She thought about Siri's question. No, I'm not enjoying life. She thought. I'm not happy. I hate my life. Don't keep waiting for people who don't deserve you, Siri said. If there's someone who makes you happy and is there for you, make sure you hang on to them. Don't lose them. Cassandra was shocked. It felt like Siri could see what was going on in her life, and she was sure she was talking about Jason and Samuel. Siri continued, And if it gets tough, go and stand on the top of the hill and shout, Screw you, life! Trust me, you'll feel so much better. She chuckled, and her laugh brought Cassandra back from her thoughts. Alan ruffled Siri's hair and put some pasta on her plate. Eat, he said. Siri nodded and stole a glance at Cassandra. She didn't know why she felt the urge to say those things to her. I'll definitely take your advice, Siri, Cassandra said, laughing. She turned to Alan. Shall we go horseback riding this weekend? She asked. Alan had taught her how to ride when she was a kid, and she had fallen in love with it. You'll have to ask my wife for permission, Alan replied. I can't leave the house without it. Cassandra rolled her eyes. Seriously? Don't show off. Yes, I'm serious, Alan replied. Ask her, and if she agrees, I'll go. Siri frowned. She was worried about Alan's injuries, and she didn't like the idea of him doing anything too strenuous and sporty. Could you go next week, Cassandra? She said. Alan is still recovering. Cassandra's eyes widened. You're sick, Alan? Why didn't you tell me? She asked, pouting. I'm okay, Alan replied, patting her head. It's just a few burns. I'll live. Cassandra ignored Alan and turned to Siri. Okay, we'll go next week. Will you come too? Siri looked at her expectant expression and nodded. All right, she said. I'll come. Okay. Cassandra replied, beaming. She turned back to her food. Why did you choose me as the ambassador for your new collection? Cassandra asked. She looked at Siri, who was casually flipping the pages of a magazine. They had finished eating, and Alan had gone into the study to talk to his mother. Siri and Cassandra were alone in the lounge. Siri looked up and smiled at Cassandra. Because you fit the theme of the collection. Cassandra started to fidget with her fingers. I have a bad reputation, she said. Aren't you afraid I'll destroy your company's reputation? Siri shook her head and shrugged. Mine is bad too, but what matters is how you use something like that to your advantage. Cassandra nodded and smiled. For the first time, someone believed in her. She had to admit that it felt nice. I won't disappoint you, she said. Siri nodded. Good. Episode 137 From a House to a Home Later that day, Cassandra returned home and found her mother, Lily, waiting for her in the living room. Cassandra raised her eyebrows for a moment before ignoring her and heading straight to her bedroom. Cassandra! Lily shouted. Cassandra groaned and turned to look at her mother. She hated to admit it, but she had always thought she was particularly beautiful and elegant. Yes, she said as she strode toward her. Why didn't you go to school today? Lily asked angrily. Cassandra yawned and rolled her eyes. The second she had seen her mother, she had known they were going to have another one of their usual fights. Because I didn't want to, she replied, shrugging nonchalantly. You! Lily shouted. She could feel her temper rising, and she took a deep breath to calm herself down before continuing. I know you've been skipping classes, you've not taken the exams, and I've been told that you smoke. Cassandra hummed to herself. Lily looked at the bored expression on her daughter's face, and her irritation continued to grow. She didn't know what she had done in a previous life to deserve a daughter like Cassandra. 
She couldn't understand why she didn't possess the same grace and class as the daughters of her high society friends. Cassandra seemed like a member of a gang in comparison. Cassandra saw the disgust and disdain in her mother's eyes. She laughed to herself, and the sound vibrated in her chest. What a fool I am to think my mother would actually like me, she thought. That one day she'd look at me with even a little bit of love and affection. You went on a business trip for ages, Cassandra said. No calls, no messages, nothing. And the first thing you ask your daughter, the same daughter you haven't seen in weeks, is why she didn't go to school? Her voice was laced with sarcasm, and her lips curled into a sneer. Sometimes I wonder if I really am your daughter, she finished. Lily felt a pang of embarrassment, but she quickly recovered. Don't try to change the subject, she shouted. You better give me a good explanation for why you've been skipping school or... Or what? Cassandra interrupted. Her mother never failed to amaze her. She never gave her daughter any words of affection, and Cassandra had always thought she only ever cared about herself and her reputation. Stop talking back to me, Lily replied. I don't want you to ruin your life. Why are you doing this, huh? Don't we give you everything you need? All you have to do is make us proud. Is that too much to ask? Cassandra stared at her mother. She could feel her body being consumed by a wave of numbness that seemed to dig deep into her very soul. She clenched her fists and looked at the woman who had given birth to her. She's never given me an ounce of love, she thought. Will I ever love her? No, maybe. Only God knows. I want to shout at her. I want to tell her what I need. All I've ever wanted is my parents' love and affection. Is that too much to ask? But Cassandra knew better than to say anything like that. Are you done? She asked instead. The more time she spent with her mother, the more disappointed she felt. Lily rubbed her temples. Go back to Europe. She mumbled. Cassandra's eyes widened. Her mother was sending her away again. It was clear she didn't want her disgraceful daughter around when she had a reputation to uphold that Cassandra could ruin. Cassandra laughed humorlessly. Are you throwing me away again, like a rag? Are you afraid people will question why the great philanthropist who talks about good behavior has a mess for a daughter? Are you afraid they're going to question your skills as a mother? That society is going to taunt you for how you raised me? They're going to say you didn't raise me well. Maybe they're right. Word after word flowed through Cassandra's lips. Rage was already simmering inside Lily, and as she listened, a wave of fury crashed through her. She could feel her blood boiling. All she wanted was to make Cassandra stop talking, and she barely had a chance to think about what she was doing before her hand connected with Cassandra's cheek. She felt a stinging sensation on her palm as Cassandra's head jolted to the side. The slap was so hard that her cheek immediately turned bright red. Silence fell between them. The servants were nearby, and they stood and stared, looking at Cassandra with blame in their eyes. Cassandra watched and saw them whispering to each other. She burst out laughing. The sound was manic and filled with anguish, and it echoed in the room. Despite the pain, she didn't touch her cheek. Instead, she stood and stared at her mother as her lips curled into a sadistic smile. Lily opened her mouth and closed it again. She had fought with her daughter countless times before, but she had never raised a hand against her. She had always thought that as long as she never physically hurt Cassandra, everything else was okay. What she didn't know was that her words caused more emotional damage than any physical pain could. Cassandra looked at her mother. She was trying to find even a trace of remorse in her eyes, but there was none. Lily felt no agonizing pain for what she had done to her own child. I hope you're happy now, Cassandra whispered calmly. There were no emotions in her voice. She walked toward the door. Cassandra! Lily shouted after her. If you walk out that door, don't come back. She hated the nonchalant way in which Cassandra was acting. Despite what had happened, her daughter's refusal to bend to her will only made her angrier. Cassandra stopped at the door. She turned back and smirked at Lily. Remember, mother, she said, her voice venomous. At the end of the day... You're just a wife. I'm my father's daughter. 
and then she was gone. She left the place that, for her, was only ever a house, never a home. Episode 138, An Evil Witch Come on, Sammy, it'll be fun, Billy said to his brother. Stop making that face. You look like we're going to rob a bank or something. Ah, Sammy whined. I spent so much time organizing my closet, and now look, you ruined it. He stared at his brother blankly as Billy smiled sheepishly and poked his head out from behind the closet door. Well, you should hire a maid to do that for you, he said. Also, you can't blame me. I don't want you to look like a middle-aged businessman at the club. You're 23. You should start dressing like it, not like a granddad. He flung a few clothes onto the floor, muttering about Samuel's bad taste. What's wrong with dressing decently? Sammy complained. Billy ignored him and focused on finding him an outfit to wear. After a moment, he cried out excitedly. This is perfect. Hurry up and try it on. Sammy stared at the clothes with his lips pursed. Seriously, dude, Billy said. You need to loosen up. No wonder your Miss Batty doesn't want you. He smirked expectantly. He knew that mentioning Cassandra was bound to get his brother to agree. Sammy glared at his brother for a second before taking the clothes. Only for today, he mumbled. Yes, sir, Billy grinned sarcastically. Idiot, Sammy said. Billy pretended to gasp and clutch his chest as if he was in pain. Sammy rolled his eyes. A short while later, they arrived at the club. Time to find some ladies, Billy exclaimed excitedly as he hopped out of the car. He slammed the door shut and made his way to the entrance. Sammy rolled his eyes and followed his brother. He looked at the line of people that were queued up on the sidewalk inside. He was starting to regret his decision to go out. Sammy, here! Billy waved at his brother, and some of the people turned to stare at Samuel. Billy was a regular, and the bouncer at the door nodded and let them both through. The moment they walked in, Sammy's ears were assaulted by the sound of loud music, and he frowned. The women around him were practically batting their eyelashes at him, and he wrinkled his nose. Billy noticed his brother's sullen mood. Relax, bro, he said, slapping Sammy on the back. Sammy gritted his teeth as he felt some of the women purposefully brush against him. Fortunately, Billy led them straight to the bar and ordered them a whiskey. It looks like a lot of the girls are checking you out, bro, Billy shouted into Sammy's ear over the music. Don't you want to hook up with one of them? It might just loosen you up a bit. Sammy frowned and he shook his head. Billy chuckled and took a sip of his drink. He turned around and started to flirt with the woman sitting next to him. Sammy tried to sit casually at the bar, and he let his eyes roam around the club without touching his whiskey. His gaze was caught by a woman dancing in the middle of the room. She was holding a drink in one hand as her hips swayed to the music. He could see some of the men looking at her hungrily, and he felt a wave of possessiveness surge through him. He abruptly stood up and made his way toward her. As he walked, he saw another man approaching her, and he sped up and pushed through the sweaty bodies of the people around him. He let out a sigh of relief when he reached her first. Sammy tapped the woman on the shoulder and she turned around. Hey, it's my cutie pie, Cassandra exclaimed. Sammy could tell she was drunk. Cassandra looked him up and down. He was dressed in black and was wearing skinny jeans, a fitted t-shirt, and a leather jacket. I almost didn't notice you. You look hot and sexy, she shouted. Sammy felt his heart beginning to beat faster and he blushed. Cassandra giggled and hugged him. Sammy tensed up as he felt her body against his, and the blood rushed to his cheeks. She was squeezing him tightly, and he cleared his throat as he pulled away. Let's get you home, he shouted. You probably need some rest. Cassandra blinked and screwed up her face. Home, she said, hiccuping. H-O-M-E, she spelled out before laughing. Okay. Let's go, cutie, she said. Sammy led her outside and helped her into the passenger seat before getting into the car himself. The second he switched on the engine, she started to sing. It sounded like a love song, but it didn't make any sense. Sammy sighed but said nothing. He could tell by the look in her eyes that she was in pain. Samuel, 
Cassandra said after a few minutes of driving. Hmm? Sammy replied, glancing at her. I think I'm going to puke, she replied. Sammy quickly pulled over, and Cassandra got out and threw up on the side of the road. Sammy grabbed a bottle of water from the back seat and ran over to give it to her. Cassandra looked at him gratefully before taking it and rinsing her mouth. Let's get some fresh air before we get back in, Sammy suggested. Cassandra nodded. She sat on the hood as Sammy leaned against the car. He looked up at the night sky. Are you okay? He asked after a few minutes of silence. Hmm. Define okay, Cassandra replied, deliberately sounding dramatic. Samuel let out a sigh. You need to find me a hotel, Cassandra said. An expensive one. I'm going to spend every penny of their money. After all, that's all they give me. Money, money, money. Sammy raised his eyebrows. Hotel? He asked. Yeah, Cassandra nodded. That witch. She slapped me, so I walked out on her. And she told me. She told me not to come back. She shrugged as Sammy's eyes widened. He studied her carefully. He had been scared to look at her properly before because he had been worried she would tease him. But now the moonlight lit up her face, and despite her makeup, he could clearly see the red handprint on her cheek. The witch? He asked. Are you talking about... My mother, Cassandra finished. She's an evil witch. Episode 139, Stay With Me. Sammy and Cassandra sat together in silence and gazed up at the moon. Sammy then glanced at Cassandra. He saw pain flickering in her eyes. How can her parents not notice that their daughter needs them? He wondered. Cassandra shivered, and Sammy took off his jacket and draped it around her shoulders. She was only wearing a tank top and black skinny jeans. My cutie is such a gentleman, she murmured with a smile. Sammy grinned with pleasure. He wanted to ruffle her hair when she was so affectionate, and a faint blush tinted his cheeks when he realized what he was thinking. He looked at her beautiful eyes and felt his heart thumping in his chest. His gaze traveled to her lips as she licked them. How would it feel to have those lips locked with mine? He couldn't help but wonder. The tips of Sammy's ears flushed red. He shook his head to get the dirty thoughts out of his head. What is wrong with me? He wondered. When did I become such a pervert? He decided to start the conversation again and take his mind off such things. So what about your father? Where is he? Cassandra's brows puckered. Him? He's probably working in his office at the moment. That man is obsessed with his job. She missed the time when her father used to be around. They would go for ice cream together like a happy family. But one night, everything changed. Sammy guessed what her problem was. Her parents had been so focused on their careers that they had forgotten her, and she had started to rebel in order to get their attention. He felt a pang in his chest. He had grown up in a loving and supporting family, so he couldn't relate to her situation, but he definitely didn't want her to be sad. Come on, let's go, he said. Cassandra squinted her eyes but nodded. All right. Sammy helped her down before opening the car door for her. They were both lost in their thoughts as he started the engine. It was Cassandra who finally broke the silence. Where are we going? Sammy glanced at her with a mischievous smile. We are going to spend Daddy's money at the most expensive hotel on the East Coast. Cassandra's eyes sparkled with excitement. I thought you were going to take me home, but I guess the hotel will do. She said. She gave him a subtle wink. Sammy blushed. Twenty minutes later, they pulled up at the hotel. The owner was shrouded in mystery, but everyone agreed that the hotel's architecture was extraordinary. When they walked into the foyer, Cassandra was deeply impressed with what she saw. Shit, this hotel is amazing! She exclaimed in a loud voice as she swirled around. Sammy chuckled. The other guests in the lobby shot her disdainful glares, but she just waved merrily at them, which made them shake their heads. The owner is very mysterious, Sammy said. It's rumored that he built the hotel simply because he was bored. Very few people have even seen him. I like mysterious people. Maybe I should investigate him, 
Might be fun to get him as a sugar daddy, Cassandra said teasingly. Sammy frowned. He didn't like to hear such jokes, but he didn't say anything. Cassandra had a drink in the sumptuous lobby as Sammy went to the reception to book their room with the credit card she had given him. He could have paid himself, but he knew she wanted to pay to make a statement to her father. Her family was rich, but her father would nevertheless receive an alert from the bank. Maybe he would come to check up on his daughter when he found out that she was spending thousands of dollars at a hotel room. When the booking was done, the manager escorted them personally to their room. Wow, is this elevator made of gold? Cassandra asked. The manager laughed. He knew that she was drunk but still found it funny. Yes, it is. No way. You're serious? The manager nodded. Yes, I'm serious. That's incredible. Why didn't I know about this hotel before? The manager smiled. Only a few extremely wealthy people know about this place. It's a secluded getaway for the elite. That makes sense, Cassandra thought. People in the upper class don't want their favorite place to become common knowledge. The elevator stopped on the 26th floor. Cassandra's eyes lit up when she saw their room. It was a penthouse suite. This must cost a fortune, she said. Sammy smiled and nodded. Yeah, it does. Cassandra was pleased as she walked over to the window. However rich Daddy is, he'll surely raise his eyebrows when he receives this bank alert, she thought. Sammy thanked the manager, who left after telling them to ring for the concierge if they needed anything. So, are you happy now? Sammy asked. Cassandra nodded. Absolutely. I'm going to order the most expensive food and wine I could find. I'm going to treat myself like a queen. Sammy nodded encouragingly. You should. You deserve it, Queen. He moved next to her and cupped her cheeks. Does it hurt? He asked softly, gently rubbing the red mark from her mother's slap. Cassandra breathed deeply as Sammy pressed his body close to hers. She gazed into his eyes, and her heart skipped a beat at the intense emotions she saw in them. No, there's no pain. Sammy furrowed his brows and looked at her closely. He wondered if she was telling the truth. As soon as his eyes met hers, he felt as if time had stopped moving. His heart was beating rapidly in his chest. This woman will be the death of me, he thought. He let his gaze drop to her lips and suddenly remembered the night when they had shared their first kiss. Are her lips as soft as I remember? He took a step back and flashed her a smile. Time to sleep. I'll see you tomorrow morning. He turned and began to walk toward the door but Cassandra's voice stopped him in his tracks. Please stay with me. Episode 140 Wine and Kisses Dad, I've gotten a girl pregnant. Sammy hung up and Cassandra burst into laughter. Sammy groaned. He's going to kill me. Don't be so dramatic. I'm sure he'll understand. Cassandra laughed so much that she clutched her stomach. Sammy stared at her, his lips curved into a smile. As long as she's happy, that's the most important thing, he thought. When she had asked him to stay with her, he had agreed. After all, he couldn't let slip an opportunity to get closer to her, and he hadn't really wanted to leave her alone when she was in a bad mood. Cassandra had ordered four bottles of the most expensive wine. They were drinking the third and playing truth or dare. Okay, your turn, Sammy said. He was completely drunk and was not feeling shy any longer. Cassandra pouted. Uh, truth. Sammy licked his lips. What is the most terrifying thing in the world for you? Cassandra gave a sad smile. Being happy. It's the most terrifying thing in the universe. Sammy frowned. Why? Cassandra snorted and gulped down her wine. Because once you're happy... It can be taken away from you just like that. Then your heart will hurt and your soul will bleed. Pathetic, right? Sammy moved closer to her and tucked a strand of hair behind her ear. Thanks to the alcohol, he had lost all his usual shyness. He slid the tips of his fingers down her neck as gently as a feather. No, Cassandra. Being happy isn't terrifying. 
You just need to find the right person to make you happy. Trust me, happiness is a wonderful feeling. Cassandra sat still. Sammy's words rang in her ears, and her heart started to race. She nudged him playfully. Are you trying to flirt with me? Sammy grinned and nodded. Is it working? Cassandra's eyes widened. Alcohol, what have you done to my cutie? Her words made Sammy smile. I'm a man, Cassandra, not a saint. Cassandra's eyes gleamed with mischief. She liked this bold version of her good boy. She leaned against his body and could feel muscles she didn't know he had. Her fingers sneaked under his shirt, tracing patterns on his skin. Do you have any idea how attractive you look tonight? She whispered. Sammy was staring at her as if he was gazing at the most precious object in the world. Cassandra spoke up again. Tell me, cutie, do you like me touching you? She purred as she nuzzled his jawline. Sammy felt lightheaded with joy at being so close to her. A torrent of emotions welled up inside him, but he kept them under control. Is it just me, or is it suddenly hot in here? He wondered. He stared at her for a few seconds longer and held her wrist. It's time for bed, Batty. Let's get you up. Cassandra pouted. Batty, is that your new nickname for me? Sammy grinned. You call me cutie, so I'll call you Batty. They rhyme, kinda. Cassandra rolled her eyes, and Sammy chuckled as he helped her stand up and escorted her to the bed. When they reached it, Cassandra pulled Sammy down to make him fall on top of her. Sammy gently stroked her cheeks and gazed into her eyes. Cassandra liked him more and more. Why didn't I notice how handsome he is in all this time? She thought with amazement. He's the nicest person I've ever met, and he's always been there when I've needed him. Her mind gave a response immediately. Because you were busy obsessing about someone who doesn't want you. Sammy was about to speak, but before he could, he felt her lips on his. Shock and joy ran through his body as his heart pumped wildly. He didn't really know what to do, nor had he even kissed a girl as deeply as this before, but he trusted his instincts. It was time to go with the moment. Sammy. Cassandra whispered as she wrapped her hands around his neck to pull him closer to her. Sammy savored the taste and softness of her lips. It was like nothing he had experienced before. After what seemed like an eternity, he wrenched himself away and rested his head on the pillow. Their breathing was ragged and heavy. As they looked at each other again, Sammy saw a tumult of emotions reflected in her beautiful eyes. In a sudden movement, he disentangled himself and stood up from the bed. I'm so sorry, he said. A trace of hurt flashed through Cassandra's eyes. Is he rejecting me? She thought in disbelief. Even Sammy doesn't want me. Nobody does. She felt her heart shatter. There was nothing she could do to stop the pain. She covered her face with her hands and burst into tears. Sammy looked thunderstruck. Cassandra, why are you crying? Did I say something to hurt you? You don't want me. Nobody wants me. Sammy was astonished by her words. He wrapped his strong arms around her in a tight grip as her sobs filled the room. Don't misunderstand me. It's just that we're both drunk, and I don't want us to do anything we might regret later. At that moment, Cassandra totally broke down. Her mother's slap, her parents' indifference to everything she did, and her fears and loneliness finally brought out all the emotions she had been bottling up. Sammy rocked her slowly in his arms, her face buried in the crook of his neck. Every tear was like a knife piercing through his heart. He felt helpless as her tears soaked through his shirt. He hadn't considered that his actions could hurt her, even though he was pretty sure she wouldn't remember any of this in the morning. Sammy kept her wrapped tightly in his arms until she fell asleep.